start? Yeah, you start, Rupa. Yeah. Good morning, one and all. Honorable dignitaries, our esteemed chief guest, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of University of Mumbai, Dr. Ravindra Kulkarni, Principal Professor Dr. S. V. Rathod, Chairperson of Board of Studies in English, University of Mumbai, Dr. Sudhir Nikam, Members of Board of Studies in English, University of Mumbai, a keynote speaker, Dr. Kumi Vivayana, resource persons, namely Dr. Sharad Srivastav, Dr. R.P. Singh, and Dr. Sachin Labade, principals, vice principals, and academicians from various colleges, faculty members, students, and participants from across the country. On behalf of Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan's Hazarimal Somani College of Arts and Science, and Jairam Das Patel College of Commerce and Management Studies. I, Dr. Rupa Sumna Deshmukhya, heartily welcome you all to this national webinar on Reflections on the Post-COVID Literary Scenario, jointly organized by the Department of English and IQAC of Bhavan Somani College in association with the Board of Studies in English, University of Mumbai. May I now request everyone to kindly rise for the national anthem. We begin all our programs with the Bhavan's prayer. May I now request our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Manjusha Patwardhan, to kindly recite the Bhavan's prayer. Oh, 
Thank you, ma'am, for that melodious rendition. Start okay. at Chuka. The world today is witnessing unprecedented times, and every individual is making an attempt to cope with this crisis in the best possible manner. Literature is. and has always been an empowering agent poets writers and novelists have articulated their feelings and concerns through the medium of their creative works like always and like all erstwhile natural or man made crises literature has played a significant role and even today it would play a role in reviving human spirit through all the available media and who would work as balm to soothe the wounds a theme like reflections on the post covid literary scenario will definitely propel the thinkers in this field to ponder over the impact of the pandemic on the emerging literature this national webinar precisely wishes to deliberate upon those possibilities that would prepare a framework and also chart out a pathway as we come out of this distressing period of covid-19 The webinar will take us through the spectrum of powerful emotions which might emerge as we engage with the narratives that the resource persons today are going to explore and help us connect with literature in a more engaging and meaningful manner. Thank you. We are now request our respected principal Professor Dr S V Rathod to deliver the welcome address. thank you rupa madam good morning to one and all esteemed chief guest honorable professor pro vice chancellor dr ravindra kulkarni the chair person of board of studies in english university of mumbai dr sudhir nikam keynote speaker of today's webinar umi vivaina resource persons of the webinar namely dr srivastava dr rp singh and dr sajin labde convener of the conference ms uh, mc halloween principals vice principals teaching faculty from across the country i welcome it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this national webinar on reflections on the post covid literary scenario organized jointly by the department of english and iqst bharti vidya bhavan's hazarimal somani college of arts and science and jairam das patel college of commerce and management studies in associations with board of studies in english university of mumbai during this period of lockdown our college has organized webinars on cyber security political and economic thoughts of dr b r ambedkar recent trends and opportunities of chemicals and pharmaceuticals industries and collaborations webinars with maharashtra college on teaching with technology 
this national webinar organized by the department of english and iqac in collaborations with bos in english university of mumbai is also equally relevant in the present times literature and literary texts have played a key role in mirroring society and offering solace during times of crisis since time immemorial literature in various forms like stories poetry novels novels and other creative works of arts has generated varied perspective towards the issue which have a bearing on the individual and society this not only means individuals perspective towards the life but it also paves way to constructive learning which adds in the life the webinar will surely create opportunities to explore their vibrant subjects in the unique and innovative manners the resource persons today from various school of thoughts would bring fresh perspectives to this subject with their scholarly insight on the topic deployment of the knowledge will also facilitate the most comprehensive approach to research with this background this webinar aims to present a forum for an exchange of ideas and promote healthy discussion i hope that all of us will have an enriching experience and academically fruitful deliberations at this webinar i wish each one of you rewarding experience thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir for sharing your valuable insights and i'm sure this webinar will be an enriching experience for all i now request our iqac coordinator dr manjusha patwardhan to introduce honorable pro vice chancellor dr ravindra kulkarni thank you rupa ma'am it is a great honor for me to introduce honorable pro vice chancellor of university of mumbai dr ravindra kulkarni as a pro vice chancellor he has been instrumental in promoting academic excellence in the university prior to this administrative responsibility as pro vice chancellor dr kulkarni had been on prestigious position and served as a director of reputed institutions like university institute of chemical technology and north maharashtra university jalgaon his areas of professional interests have been polymers pigments and paints fats oleochemicals and surfactants perfumes waxes and cosmetics nanotechnology reaction engineering and catalysis he has extensive research publications at the national and international level and has received numerous awards for his outstanding contribution to the field several students have completed their phd's under his tutelage he has presented research papers at international forums and has over 305 citations to his credit sir is also reputed for his popular talks on matters related to science dr kulkarni received the best teacher award at the hands of his excellency shri shankar narayanan governor of maharashtra state in august 2014 from north maharashtra university jalgaon as a part of silver jubilee and foundation day celebrations for the purpose of research he visited countries like singapore germany thailand indonesia netherlands <laughs> france switzerland japan and had enriching academic interaction with the university faculty members Sir has been a resource person at many refresher and short term training programs. He was invited to give a talk on engineering education and placement in India International Symposium on Global Engineering Education to Kusima University Japan in 2014. He has been granted several patents and authored books on subjects related to nanomaterials polymerization and their applications. 
he also undertook several industrial projects and consultancy work. Dr. Kulkarni executed research projects funded by the DRDO, MHRD, UGC, AICTE, and DST. He is also a member of professional bodies like Essential Oil Association of India, life member at Oil Technologists Association of India, Indian Society for Technical Education, and Asian Polymer Society, Delhi. He has great experience in handling assessment related practices of NAC, NBA, and NIRF. We feel highly privileged that, sir, you have accepted our invitation and graced the inaugural function. I now request, sir, to kindly address everyone. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Dr. Kulkarni, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manjusha, uh, IQC Director of the College, Principal Ratu. Bhavans College, Dr. Sudhir Nikam, Chairman, Board of Studies in English of University of Mumbai, the esteemed speakers for this one, uh, this webinar, and all my dear delegates, a warm good morning to all of you. The webinar has really chosen a right theme in current uh, context. We always say that literature or uh, language are the forms of human consciousness. They reflect the outlook and perception of the world of man. They coexist in constant close cooperation. And the career of uh, uh, culture, language, and literature is always society, personality, and therefore, they cannot exist outside the society. And naturally, in post-COVID situation, the literature must reflect the sorrow of the human being which they are uh, passing through. According to the great German linguist, Weiserberg, uh, who introduced the scientific terminology of the concept of language as a picture of the world. He says language is the mediator, language and literature is the mediator between the objective world and our consciousness as a kind of creative force in all areas of spiritual and cultural life. Pointing uh, to the nature of language and literature as a unique tool for understanding the world, one must uh, take up the right uh, mode of expression of different feelings, emotions of the human being. Friends, post-COVID situation has really presented a challenge before uh, human being. What we come across like probably uh, uh, many uh, pictures of unhappiness and emotion, uh, uh, sorrow uh, in the form of uh, for example, the labor who need to uh, go back to their state and actually uh, their uh, sorrow or uh, uh, grief is really has no bound. They naturally need an expression in the form of literature. Particularly in uh, normal, uh, under any uh, pandemic, it is the uh, poor people, it is the people who live in po poverty are always finding the major dilemma, major problems, major issues. So, for example, a simple uh, solution, simple uh, concept that has been always presented as a safety, like uh, keep on washing your hands as a regular practice. Now, those who do not have enough amount of water, even for drinking, for them using water as a regular practice of washing will be a major issue. So, there Grief must have a right expression in the form of literature. Situation is given, even uh, in fact, a other part of the life also. For example, like we as a uh, professional do not find enough time for family, but because of uh, uh, lockdown, say one has to spend uh, enough time in the uh, house itself, and that definitely has provided a right platform for interactions within the family. And naturally, uh, when the family interacts so strongly, one a personal person comes out in the form of more stronger nature. A uh, good family interaction has definitely resulted into, uh, and that must find expression in the form of literature. So literature and uh, said the language definitely should present the wider spectrum of the emotions, which may be opposite, and as the uh, as the theme has presented, it is a repository of all these emotions. So I 
do you expect that the post covid situation will give a good opportunity for uh, uh, the linguist literature uh, in the form of wider publications and uh, in the form of wider uh, presentations and expressions itself so for example like uh, in uh, the when the terrorist attack was happened on mumbai uh there after post terrorist attack a group uh, kept on searching what would have been the impact of this terrorist attack on the people who were sailing across the road what was their impact and that resulted into good literature expression so literature as a uh, form of human consciousness must come across the wider spectrum of the human being and see that like uh, all forms of the emotions uh, would have been rightly expressed so i congratulate the organizers for taking up a real right team and uh, i hope with this particular webinar many delegates will take up uh, um, uh, inspiration and will move on for uh, expressing the human consciousness as a part of this post covid situation if that really happens then the uh, webinar the theme of the webinar will be really successful so i extend my sincere thanks uh, to the organizers for inviting me to be the part of this inaugural uh, uh, inauguration of this webinar uh, i thank the delegates to be here for the uh, inaugural session and they are listening me patiently uh, so uh, i extend my best wishes thank you jai hind jai maharashtra thank you very much sir for gracing the occasion and sharing your valuable insights you have really set the tone for this webinar with your address and we are inspired by your words thank you very much sir i now take pleasure in introducing uh, the chairperson of board of studies in english dr sudhir nikam dr sudhir nikam is an associate professor and head of post graduate department of english at bnn college bhiwandi mumbai he is a member of the academic council and the research and recognition committee university of mumbai sir has extensive research experience and under his able guidance 13 students have been awarded the phd degree he has also been a referee for phd vivas at several universities sir is a member of the research and recognition committee at dr baba saheb ambedkar technological university and kj somaya comprehensive college mumbai he is also former secretary of indian association for canadian studies he has published books and journals at the national and international level he is a, he is an editor of literary insight a refereed international journal and an editor of few other reputed journals as board of studies chairperson he has taken significant initiatives to promote academic excellence i now request sir to talk about the board of studies in english university of mumbai and about the webinar over to you dr nikam sir thank you dr rupa uh, for giving my introduction and it is my privilege to be here to talk about uh, the theme of the webinar honorable professor ravindra kulkarni the pro vice chancellor of the university of mumbai and our uh, advisor and mentor principal dr s v rathod the principal of bhavans college mumbai madam halloween the convener of this webinar dr rupa deshmukhya the co convener of the webinar and iqsc coordinator dr manjusha patwardhan i also uh, thank the resource persons including the keynote speaker madam <laughs> professor kumi vivena professor sharad srivastava professor r p singh and dr sachin labde in this national webinar on reflections on the post covid literary scenario friends the onset of corona virus around the world has been sudden and overwhelming much is being written about this virus that binds us but holds us apart people have taken to worse 
to express their new realities and internet abounds with the literature especially poetry on this new lifestyle that has taught us not to take anything for granted and this new uh, quietude we are very unused to corona poetry and covid 19 poetry are treating on social media stalwart writers and poets from around the world versifying by minute about the challenges the virus has thrown up such as isolation quarantine sickness and loneliness writers poets look at it as an opportunity to slow down and savor life one day at a time irish poet for example brother richard henrik his poem is titled as lockdown in one is one of such it went viral as the world resonated with it and uh, it is uh, interesting to know that it has got 36000 uh, shares at, in one day he speaks of the birds that have begun to sing again and of skies that have turned blue again when i think about this pandemic i feel humans have always had their own ways disaster and literature have always been born out of great suffering now we have the facility to air our haikus and verses instantly as they occur to us british poet for example simon armitage in a poem it is also titled as lockdown the title of the poem is lockdown remembers that villagers of eem it is a, a small village in derbyshire who locked themselves up during the outbreak of plague in the 17th century this is the perfect example of post apocalyptic poetry when we read or study english literature we can say that the seeds of these outbreaks are rooted in the ancient literature just read the classic literary work of albert camus the plague and the decameron by boccaccio the primary lesson of plague literature from from uh, uh, many writers is how predictably humans respect to such crises over millennia there has been a consistent pattern to behavior during epidemic the hoarding the panicking the fear the blaming blaming the superstition the selfishness the surprising heroism the fixation with the members of reported dead and the boredom during the quarantine which we have we are already experiencing to a greater extent literature during and after covid 19 will teach us that lockdown period must be accepted uh, lockdown period must be accepted as the period of great isolation literature can help you tackle the gloom it teaches us life is persistent and relentless that uncertainty is the only uh, constant so like literature the pandemic has inspired people to pause and reflect so it is a moment to uh, brood over something to decide about the future course of action literature after after covid 19 will have the opportunity as uh, our pro vaisal sir has rightly pointed it out to reflect on the values and lessons that were reflected during covid 19 pandemic probably in the last days there have been global talks about hygiene intimacy compassion at levels that we have not encountered before in post 19 literary scenario covid 19 scenario the values and like are no longer viewed only in abstract by general public but there is a context in which they become concretely relevant to our survival in post covid 19 literature the themes like isolation from home or from wherever we are during these times having a more or less significant role in managing the crisis will be penned down in a new way there is, there is a lot of variety of literature that will be witnessing in the coming days the literary analysis will be more useful 
in the upcoming future as our actions should be oriented towards protecting these values with priority what i feel after corona trauma the literature will come with new ideas new themes such as impact of the situation on the economy and on relationship between employees and employers ill illness employment bankruptcy and lost profits new behavioral approach new face of danger new global crisis in conflict between lives and livelihoods so friends literature is not simply a uh, uh, a product which is uh, being produced in an isolated way it has a reflection of all the activities that happen around us so if we are seen from the point of view of our personality each person is unique from a cultural point of view every person is different but covid 19 reminded us that from the point of view of what is important to us as humans we are all the same there is no difference between the rich and the poor and any binary oppositions between human beings when humanity has been endangered it seems like more than ever we have realized that we have the same interests and we need to cooperate regardless of religion political views or resources at hand literature does the same thing since its existence that's why it is the one thing that never fails to soothe the mind and body during a calamity literature and art join hands with authorities in reaching out to the people on how to cope up with the virus <laughs> post covid 19 literature ultimately it is about taking a relook at your priorities so we have to decide about our priorities when we read literature we come to conclusion that every generation has reason to believe that is living in a period of historical challenges whether it is wars pandemics or natural disasters humanity has been tried during many periods of crisis the biggest surprise about this crisis is that we are still surprised when they occur looking back only to the last century each experience of this nature provides a rich source of relevant information from perspective of conflict prevention management or amicable resolution to english literature and friends i am sure that the next session that will be held will deliberate on so many important themes and different avenues and scope for post pandemic literature that is in waiting so thank you dr rupa and principal sir and honorable vice chance uh, provide chancellor sir for uh, interacting with us and guiding us in a proper direction thank you over to you thank you so much uh, dr nikam uh, i would first thank you for collaborating with our college for this national webinar and guiding us through the process of organizing this webinar and you have rightly highlighted uh, the connection between literature and life and i'm sure we are going to reflect on this in all our sessions today thank you very much sir i now request dr varsha malla to introduce our keynote speaker dr kumi bevaina thank you dr rupa deshmukhya a uh, very good morning to one and all it is indeed my honor to introduce our keynote speaker dr kumi s vivaina dr vivaina is an education futurist tedx speaker an internationally acclaimed educator literary critic teacher educator writer and storyteller in october 2016 dr v vaina retired as professor and head of the department of english university of mumbai india and is now the founder director of center for connection education and management she has two phd degrees to her credit one in literature and the other in education She has published eleven books and fifty-eight papers that have appeared in peer-reviewed national and international journals and critical anthologies. She has won numerous national and international awards and is a renowned speaker who delivers lectures and leads seminars and workshops for teachers and parents. She is passionate about teaching pedagogy and has been actively involved in curriculum designing at all levels. and has helped set up study centers in india and abroad in 2013 her book on education 
sourceful intelligence, understanding uniqueness and oneness through education was selected as among the 18 best books published in the USA. And her most recent book, What Children Really Want, has received critical acclaim from educators, psychologists, parents, writers from all over the world and even the Dalai Lama. In August, September 2015, she was selected by the world leaders in education as one of the 35 women from across the world changing educational paradigms and was asked to present a paper at their international conference in the University of Waikato in Hamilton, New Zealand. Dr. Vivaina has her own storytelling organization called Wordfully Yours, which hosts storytelling programs and conducts training workshops on storytelling for enhancing eco-literacy, social literacy, and psycho-literacy. During an interview on YouTube yesterday, Dr. Vivaina launched an initiative for the youth at a global level called the ELM, Earth Love Mission program, which seeks to actualize the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nation. We feel fortunate to have amidst us a keynote speaker of her caliber, and I'm sure her keynote address will definitely inspire all of us. Before that, one announcement. Participants are requested to raise hand in case of any query after ma'am's session. And may I now request Dr. Kumi Vivaina ma'am to kindly take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Principal Rato. Thank you, uh, Ms. Halloween, Ms. Rupa, the entire staff, support staff of Bhavan's College. It's been a pleasure and an honor to, to deliver the keynote address. So I would like to share my screen and start right away if there are questions. I think Rupa, we do have time to take a few questions towards the end, am I yes. right? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So I'll share my screen with you and uh, let's start right away. Can you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. My screen? Yes, ma'am. All right. So I'll just make it full screen. So I've entitled this Reflecting on the Role of Literature in a Post COVID World. In the first part of my presentation, I'm going to briefly talk about the current consciousness and what literature can do and must do. In the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about the importance of teaching literature in our post-COVID world. There is a lot of emphasis on STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, math, but literature and the arts have a vital role to play in the post-COVID world. So the first part of my presentation is creating a new narrative. Obviously, amidst the mayhem, amidst the confusion that we witnessed today, the words that come to life almost immediately are Yeats's from Second Coming, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. But this little bit of protein covered with lipid has caused complete global chaos and things really seem to have fallen apart. But the truth is that a lot of things were actually falling apart. A lot of social systems were actually falling apart. We were trying to cover up and talk about innovations in this field and that. But these systems necessitated radical revisioning, radical rethinking. And COVID has pushed us into that. The other beautiful words that come to mind are the words from Christopher Log, which says, come to the edge, we might fall, come to the edge. Oh, it's too high, come to the edge. And they came and he pushed and they flew. Is humanity going to take this opportunity to fly or to die, we need to shape up or ship out. 
Interestingly, we human beings believe that we live by facts, but we do not. The truth is that we humans live by narratives. Joseph Campbell, one of the most illustrious mythologists of the world has rightly said, our myths are our reality. Our stories give us our identity. Margaret Atwood in her classic poem, True Story says, the true story is vicious, multiple and untrue after all. Why do you need it? Don't ever ask for a true story. And we realize the truth of it in our post COVID world where we really cannot figure out what the truth really is. Yuval Noah Harari, one of the most esteemed historians, social historians, in his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, talks about a crisis in narrative. If we are supposed to live by narratives, there are four 20th century narratives which have completely failed. Imperialism, communism, fascism, and very sadly, even liberal democracy. Liberal democracy talked about spirited individualism. And that was the spirit that got highlighted in the literature of the 90s and the millennial. But unfortunately, even liberal democracy as a narrative has not succeeded. Before COVID, we were on the verge of a new narrative, which is often referred to as biotechnological democracy. We were made to feel that AI and biotechnology would definitely create a better world, a more equitable world for humankind. All the 17 sustainable goals of the United Nations, which were created in 2015, can easily be achieved by 2030 was the mood of that time. And by that time, I mean the pre-COVID era. It was felt that we would have more leisure, that the more routine tasks would be taken over by machines, and we would literally create a fairy tale utopia. But strangely, we also knew that technology has two sides to it. Like everything that we human beings create, it has a bright side or an ego side and a dark side or the shadow side. I cannot elaborate on that in as short a presentation as this, but with the coming together of AI and biotechnology, it's only we and we humans alone who can decide what kind of world we wish to create. Amidst all this, we were landed slap bash bang in the midst of a dystopia, a post-truth dystopia, evinced by Huxley, Orwell, Bradbury, Atwood, and a host of other writers. Today, we are fumbling to really glean the truth to separate the grain from the chaff. We know very, very little about the vaccines. We know very little about why it happened. We don't, we don't really know when it's going to end. So we have been landed in a dystopia. Mind manipulation is something that started way before we encountered this dystopia. And one is reminded of the words of Aldous Huxley, that the victim of mind manipulation does not even know that he's a victim. And that is a very dangerous aspect. To him, the walls of the prison are invisible and he believes himself to be free, which is a massive delusion. As the pro vice chancellor and as Dr. Nigam very rightly pointed out, literature reflects the age. But literature does something much more than that. It creates new narratives. Literature always anticipates life. It does not copy it. 
but molds it to its purpose, said Oscar Wilde. And we know this from the whole idea of constructing identity, constructing the truth. According to C.S. Lewis, literature irrigates the deserts that our lives have already become. And we can just pray that in the post-COVID period, literature gives us a very powerful new narrative based on social justice. Literature constructs our identity at both the individual level and at the collective level. This brings me to the second part of my presentation, which is, is the teaching of literature even important in a post-COVID world? There are numerous articles which have come up, particularly in 2019, which say that literature and the arts should now be reconciled to a quiet burial. Is that possible? Is that even desirable? That is what I want to address in the latter part of this presentation. The rise of science in our present knowledge society has caused the current emphasis on STEM education in both regular education and e-learning. By STEM, I mean science, technology, engineering, and math. Very important in themselves. But should that be the only things we teach our children? Thinking through the consequences of STEM education and the naive individualistic, discipline centered STEM curriculum only prepare students for jobs and innovation. Whereas relational H teams curriculum, what do I mean by H teams? Humanity, technology, engineering, arts, math, and science. This kind of curriculum prepares students for life. Way back, Jiddu Krishnamurti, one of the greatest minds of India, talked about the need for a revolution in consciousness. And according to Krishnamurti, this is the only revolution that we need because a revolution in consciousness can bring about lasting peace. And we know the need for it in today's world. Yuval Noah Harari also talks about this. He says, a change in consciousness is more necessary now than ever before. Therefore, for every dollar spent on developing technology, the next dollar should be spent on changing consciousness. Literature and the arts help create a change in consciousness. Numerous writers have talked about how literature and the arts mold the way human beings think. After the med medieval ages, it was Leonardo da Vinci, it was Shakespeare who gave a new narrative to their age. The 19th century, it was Balzac who gave a new narrative. The 20th century saw a host of literary writers coming up almost every two decades, giving new narratives to the world. We know how vital literature and the arts are to bring about the change in consciousness. A change from polarity consciousness to unity consciousness which will allow humankind to coexist with technology, which will not allow technology to trump humanity. A polarity consciousness is me and mine alone. It's fierce individualism, 
whereas unity consciousness, consciousness of being. Interestingly, sourceful intelligence is something we need to nurture. By sourceful intelligence, I mean the capacity to understand both our uniqueness and our oneness. The upper layers of our mind, upper layers of our mind enable us to understand our uniqueness, whereas the deeper layers of the mind enable us to understand our oneness. And as we realize, literature does both. Literature respects our humanity and also respects our oneness. So literature is highly instrumental in nurturing sourceful intelligence. It helps us transition from a self versus other to a self and other to an all is self consciousness. If we remain locked in self versus other, we are constantly experiencing ourselves in isolation. We are working with the competitive spirit, me versus you. Then we feel lonely, we experience existential angst, but this is because we have this consciousness of self versus other. If we can, with the help of literature and the arts, transition to a self and other consciousness, then we talk about sharing, then we talk about collaboration. And obviously, this is a far less stressful and a more desirable position to be in. So moving from self versus other, you have your strengths and I have your strengths. Well, let's share them. Sharing is all that's necessary. The final stage is all is self. And all is self does not mean that we have some very wooey wooey idea of oneness. This is supported by quantum physics. This is supported by wisdom literature, which talks about the essential oneness of all sentient beings. This can be transacted in the classroom through a very simple process devised called technopoiesis. Technopoiesis has seven stages and it can help you actualize this in your day-to-day -day teaching. But of course, once again, in this short presentation, there isn't time for it. Literature helps us learn vital life skills. When we engage with literature by reading, writing, thinking, and discussing literature, we are helping our students develop 21st century skills like critical thinking and problem solving, absolutely vital creative thinking and problem solving. Samuel Taylor Coleridge put this idea way back across in the 18th century when he said that the aim of literature is to dissect and dissipate in order to recreate. So we do our dissection, we do our dissipation and we recreate when we are working with literature. Also, very, very importantly, one of the major 21st century skills is change orientation. According to thinkers, we would probably need our, to change our jobs every 10 years because the world is moving so rapidly. There will be more changes in the next 20 years than there have been in the past 300 years says futurist Gerd Leonard. So do we have the resilience? Do we have the capacity to change? This is again something which literature powerfully teaches us. It teaches us flexibility. Very, very importantly, literature teaches us compassion and empathy. The Dalai Lama talks about the dire need for compassionate leaders in today's world. Compassion is not pity. P 
empathy is when you look down upon someone. Compassion is when you get into the shoes of that person and genuinely empathize and attempt to understand that person. This is going to be a very, very vital skill in our post-COVID world. Happily, even during the COVID era, we have seen such marvelous examples of compassion and altruism. And we can just hope that that continues. By taking us into the minds and hearts of the characters and situations, literature really facilitates the development of compassion and empathy. Also collaboration. We cannot live in ivory towers. We cannot live all by ourselves, even with the millions of rupees that we make. The very idea that I do this, I do that has become passe already. So collaboration is going to be the need of the hour and communication excellence. But I would like to add over here, it has to be communication excellence with integrity. We need to use language and words more responsibly. We need to use language not like lucky in waiting for Godot. That is a classic satire of the way we use language. Two and a half pages of absolute nonsense in waiting for Godot. How brilliantly Samuel Beckett conveys this to us. When we use language, we need to use language with sincerity, integrity, and the genuine desire to convey our truth to others. So literature helps nurture mindfulness, which in turn generates three literacies, psycho-literacy, becoming self-smart by becoming self-aware. It's the old adage, we know this, every wisdom tradition has talked about the need to know thyself. And literature helps you to delve into your own inner scape. Social literacy, awareness of others. Earlier when we were doing English literature, we were rather circumcised and we had our consciousness rotating in and around England past present. But when the canon opened up, we realized how people think, feel and live their lives in other places, in the African countries and the Caribbean countries in Canada, New Zealand, Japan and all other places of the world. So it really helps us understand other cultures. And it also nurtures geo-literacy, which is earth awareness. And we see so much of this, particularly in nature poetry and in eco-poetry. So by teaching us to look deeper through the surface of life and acting with wisdom and ethics, literature can help us move from being idiots to tribesmen, to citizens. This is what the ancient Greeks believed. The ancient Greeks believed that idiots are those who are selfish people, who can think only of themselves. Tribesmen are those who think of their narrow loyalties, their groups, it's groupism. Whereas a citizen is one who would think of himself and his uh, group, but at the same time, think of the larger group. Philosopher Ken Wilbur talks about moving from an egocentric to an ethnocentric to a cosmocentric identity. And the literature and the arts can really facilitate this transition as well. Through poetry, drama, novel, prose, literature encourages us to take the road not taken while experiencing uniqueness and oneness. Obviously, literature does not give us a definite script to live by. It's a rough blueprint. It tells us what we 
teachers are lying and in relation to the past. But we are encouraged to take the road not taken. By blending knowledge from the outside world with wisdom that comes from the study of literature, we can and must create lives that are joyful and socially just for all living beings on the only planet we can call home. I'll end with my favorite lines from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The others sit around and pluck berries. So teachers of literature, we need to really help bring this heaven on earth, make our students see the larger picture, change our own consciousness before we can change the consciousness of our students and make our rapidly shrinking and increasingly threatened world a better place for ourselves and for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We'll now take questions from the participants. If anybody has a question for ma'am, you may raise your hand in the chat box and you can ask the question directly to ma'am. Was everyone awake? Yes, I any request, question? I request participants to raise their hand and ask a question or a comment that you would like to make. Yes, I think there's a question from Fani Kumari. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, is my voice audible, madam? Yes, it is. Madam, you have mentioned uh, uh, that uh, there is uh, no such a type of uh, system in any society, uh, communism, fascism, and even uh, democrat uh, democratic views are also not successful. Uh, and do you feel that it is uh, pseudo democracy here in our world, and it is not encouraging our literature, madam? Real democracy is not there in any country in the world. Well, as you're right. Democracy does seem a utopia by the people, for the people, of the people. It talks about equality. You're absolutely right in feeling this way. But I would say that it depends entirely on us human beings to want to create a socially just world. It's not an impossible goal. It's just that we have not taken the right path to it. Our thinking is still steeped in what Dr. Sudhir Nikam called binaries. So when there are binaries, there cannot be equality. So we have to give up this mannequin aesthetics and really start working with a consciousness change, a consciousness of oneness. And if we operate from that consciousness, well, democracy is clearly possible. Thank you, madam. Your lecture is very insightful and effectual, madam. Wonderful session, madam. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, organizers. Thank you, madam. My pleasure. Yes. There's another question by Sherilson. Please unmute. Yes. Please go ahead with your question. Unmute yourself. We can hear you. Or you can type the question. Yeah, please go ahead. Ask your question. Ma'am, this is not a question. I don't have a question, but this is just an observation. Yes. Um, that was a very powerful presentation. And um, 
uh, it gives me immense pleasure in saying that I'm really proud that I'm teaching literature because the kind of in insights and uh, perspectives ma'am has shared has made me feel that. And thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity, ma'am. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, we have Sudita Singh. Kindly unmute yourself. Oh, you make. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, this is Dr. Sunita Singh from Indore. Uh, actually, ma'am, uh, 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 it was very stimulating things, whatever we got from by you. Actually, ma'am, uh, I want to ask, Corona has uh, created a different kind of fear in every person. And conditions can be seen, struggle can be seen. What about unseen fear in people? My question is, while writing on this type of topic, writers pain will be influenced by this kind of unseen fear? And if yes, how? And how will we description this kind of scene and contemporary uh, period? A very interesting question. Um, this is my subjective take on. Fear is a very, very powerful human emotion. We don't need to deny fear. We need to live through that fear. We need to experience that fear. We need to really work with that feeling within us and then see how we can transmit. We, we at, at present, it is absolutely natural for all of us to be un, in the grips of fear. It's a human emotion, a very basic human emotion. And instead of denying those feelings, at this stage, I feel we must feel the feeling of fear very, very deeply, go deeper into it till we find a way to work it out. So thank you. That was an extremely interesting question. Thank you very much, ma'am. Welcome. Ma'am, there are a few questions on the YouTube. Uh, one of the questions is, what is the scope of Indian English literature for employment abroad? Uh, not directly connected with the literature here, the presentation here, but uh, they want your views on scope of literature for employment abroad, Indian literature. Meaning, uh, are we talking about teachers going and teaching or the teaching of text? Uh, I think uh, the teaching of text, scope of Indian English literature. Well, I think Indian English literature is taught in several universities abroad. And if the COVID has done anything. It has made us realize that globalization, the concept can be taken very seriously because the COVID knows no borders. I think the post COVID world, though at present we have shut down our borders, ideally speaking, or at least it's my hope that the post COVID world will let down what Rabindranath Tagore so rightly called our narrow domestic walls. And we will be teaching all kinds of literature, all kinds of literature everywhere. That is my hope. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, which do you think is more relevant, contemporary literature or classical literature? Your views on that? I, I cannot say which is more relevant. Mm -hmm. I think both are equally relevant. We need to see things in perspective. So classical literature is absolutely vital, I think, because it tells, it reflects the age, it gives us the narratives of that age. And if we have a historical background to literature, it's easy to compare, to contrast, to see the deviations, to see the mistakes that were made. Now, if we are talking, for instance, about uh, uh, gender studies, gender studies. Well, in the past, if there were writers who were absolutely brilliant and who were yet sexist in their tone, it's it's. In interesting to see that in the context of that age and see how things have changed now. So I would say that classical literature 
and contemporary literature are equally important and one ideally should not replace one with the other. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one of the participants would like you to explore uh, sailing to Byzantium by W.B. Yeats. How relevant is that poem today? Absolutely. All of Yeats, all his theory of the gyres and all, which was really regarded as part of his mysticism, is now becoming so relevant to us. Even the quotation that I had, the second coming, it is highly relevant that we understand all these writers, not merely Yeats, but a host of other writers have been talking about it in different ways, in different contexts. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you've given a lot of scope to people to reflect on this uh, very engaging topic. And you've rightly said that our stories give us our identity. So I'm very grateful to you that you've taken us through these dimensions of different narratives and also showed us the possible ways of dealing with this unexpected crisis. I'm sure participants have received a holistic perspective through your presentation. And what we need today is more of compassion, empathy. We hope uh, literature gives us a narrative which focuses on this oneness and narratives which bring a positive consciousness. And we also need to use language with integrity, which determines our competence. We are truly indebted to you, ma'am, uh, for sharing your like ideas. One more thing. And inspiration. The kind of humanism that yes. I'm ho hoping for. Yes. I'm hoping for a new renaissance, yes. a new humanism, which is a cosmocentric humanism, not confined yes. to Europe or yes. to England, yes. but to the cosmos. So cosmocentric humanism is what I'm looking forward to. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I will have to leave you because I have another meeting at 11.30, but I'm deeply honored and I've enjoyed these sessions, uh, this session and the interactions with people here. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Moving ahead, uh, I'm sure you're enjoying the sessions. Now we'll move ahead with our plenary sessions. And our first plenary speaker today is uh, Professor Dr. Sharad Srivastava. It is indeed an honor for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sharad Srivastava, who is a former Dean, University College of Law, M.L. Sukhadia University, Udaipur. He was adjudged as one of the best deans by the Bar Council of India. He was also a dean at University College of Social Sciences and Humanities. During his tenure, the university was accredited A plus grade by the NAC peer team. Sir has a rich academic experience of 36 years of teaching postgraduate and undergraduate classes and guiding research students. He has also been the former head of the Department of English, M.S. Sikardia University. His areas of specialization include Indian English literature, gender discourse, language and linguistics, American literature, soft skills and language communication, and short filmmaking. Under his able guidance, 25 students have completed their PhDs. He has authored 10 books on language and literature. The book entitled The New Woman in Indian English Fiction was released at the Commonwealth International Conference 1996 by one of the most renowned writers of Indian English literature, Mulkraj Anand, and later reviewed by him. Sir has edited journals of national and international repute and contributed numerous articles to refereed journals of international repute and has been a resource person at various conferences. He has also been a member of numerous academic and administrative bodies. He's a life member at International Association of Commonwealth Language and Literature, Indo-Canadian Literary Studies Association, American Studies Research Center, Language Form, Janbot, and Rajasthan Association for Studies in English. Sir, we are really honored and privileged to have you 
as our resource person for the plenary session. And I'm sure all the participants will be enthralled by our session. Over to you, sir. A very good morning to one and all. I am deeply honored to be a part of this webinar on the present scenario of COVID-19. Professor, Pro-Vice Chancellor, Principal Sir, Dr. Nikam, Dr. Rupa, other esteemed resource persons, Partip participants to this national webinar, I must put in record what Dr. Sudhim Nikam told me a few days ago. He wanted me to speak something about the present scenario. And I thought probably I could just share the feelings and emotions that I have been experiencing during the past two and a half months. I'm thankful to the organizers for having given me the opportunity. The topic that I am, want to speak today is going to be analyzing the present scenario of COVID-19 with particular reference to past literary masters. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow. When I, read, right, when I read this line of John Keats from one of his famous odes during my MA more than four decades ago, little did I, did I realize this would be the emotional state of billions of people the world over experiencing the pandemic, an unprecedented crisis that has forced people almost everywhere to remain in self-isolation or quarantine for nearly two and a half months now. Our scare with the dreaded disease continues. How else we could do otherwise in the midst of bombardment of COVID-19 news and commentary 24-7 on news networks and social networking sites. But these successive lo lockdowns had a silver lining too. They accorded the luxury of free time to almost every set of the people, forcing them to indulge in some serious introspection and stock taking of our lives as such. There are evidences galore on the net of people experimenting in music, performing arts, excelling in perfecting their culinary skills, or even doing some creative reading and writing. And I am no exception. In addition to devouring good shows on Netflix, Amazon Prime, and hot star in the company of my wife and children who now work from home as per the new norm. I went back to my books and delved deeply into the writings of the classical poets, novelists and dramatists to see if our earlier literary masters had given hints or even warned us through their writings about the kind of predicament we find ourselves in. But before I talk about individual authors, a word about the big reading project that we can undertake. You know, you have always said you wanted to read those books but you never had the time. Now you have all the time in the whole world. 
the classics that you have been wanting to read have the capacity not only to occupy a large swath of your shelter time, but to deepen your life, lift your spirits, argue with your soul, and expose you to some of the best sentences that have ever penned, that have ever passed the pen of the time. If Oh, we lost you for a moment. Is that fine? Yes, yes, it's fine now. Sir. Thank you. The, the, the digital re revolution may prove to be one of the best things in this time of uncertainty, disruption, and social panic. Social distancing is being adequately compensated by digital proximity. Coming back to the basic question, whether our earlier writers could foresee the emergence of such a situation. Of course not. Barring a few, most of them did not talk about or envisage the pandemic as such. But they did forewarn about the ills of a fast emerging industrialized society and its concomitant materialistic culture in the wake of scientific and technological revolutions and advancements. How such developments would affect the life of an individual was a subject. How they would affect the life of an individual at the micro level was a subject that got considerable amount of space in the writings of Tennyson, Arnold, Dickens, Thackeray, in particular in the, right, in the 19th century. Arnold talked about such an individual and described him with its sick hurry and divided aims as against his scholar Gypsy who embodied one aim, one business, one desire. Desire is implying the fast changing values of a society being driven more and more by mammon worship. The absence of finer values that give sustenance to the societal order are the subject of his seminal essay, Culture in Anarchy. Alfred Tennyson, whose poems in great measure reflect the conflict between religion and science, considers this dichotomy very well illustrated through his line in his most famous poem, In Memoriam, I falter where I firmly trod. These writers are being mentioned with a deliberate purpose. They could anticipate the growth of such valueless, stress-ridden individuals who would enter the mad race of materialism and consumerism in their new versions, full throttle in a big way. Such an individual would have no qualms in pursuing his materialistic ends even at the cost of human relationships and nature. The results are there for all of us to see. Breakdown of human relationships, degradation of environment at all levels, and of course, an individual suffering from neurosis and mental vacuity. The virus-induced wasteland of our times brings to our mind the famous lines penned down by T.S. Eliot 
what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or you cannot know or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. Are these lines not reminiscent in metaphorical terms of scary scenes emerging in New York, Mumbai, or any other densely populated metropolis affected by the coronavirus? In Aristotelian terms, the horrifying spectacle had a gruesome beginning, whether in Wuhan or in some laboratory where the virus was technologically engineered or in some wet market, we do not know. But we are certainly in the middle of it, desperately waiting for a vaccine or a miracle to end the catastrophe affecting the humankind. Ironically, the classical story of Oedipus the Rex, in that story, Tereshis, who is all-knowing, is able to identify the cause of the plague and even suggest a way out for redemption of the ancient classical wasteland. But here, we are at the mercy of scientists and doctors and the R&D of billion-dollar pharma industries to invent a vaccine or a viable, affordable, curative medicine. Till now, we have concentrated on the external manifestation of the disease and its ill effects. But on a deeper analysis, we find the presence of a moral virus, equally debilitating as per the physical variety. The plague is our moral indifference to the suffering of others, including the suffering that we may not directly endorse, but which occurs under our, under our implied consent through our silence. Thus, a cruise missile attack that shatters a wedding in Afghanistan, or a terrorist attack on Twin Towers or Mumbai, or London Underground, are manifestations of this moral virus within. The reason for this kind of situation had been beautifully depicted by W.B. Yeats in his famous poem, The Second Coming, emphasized by the line, the best lack conviction. Incidentally, the keynote speaker also, Professor Vivani, she began her address by referring to this famous poem, but a different stanza. When I say the best lack conviction, when I take this line from his poem, I think he was undoubtedly referring to the moral virus that is so deeply entrenched within our elite, particularly the intelligentsia, which has continued to shirk its responsibility through its utter indifference and apathy, resulting in the kind of crisis we find ourselves in. The seed of annihilation is active like a virus in each of us. And nobody gives us the timeline. Each of us, therefore, has a duty to think about life in the shadow of this wider, more metaphoric plague or virus and to redefine our lives accordingly. If there is meaning in the universe, each one of us provides it in our work, our loves, our friendship, our avocations, and our thoughts. There is abundance of literature on the pandemic on the pandemics of the past. And in recent times, quite a few films have also been made on the subject. 
incidentally, I too had the occasion to see contagion during the period of the first lockdown. Before discussing two specific examples, it would be relevant to ask from all of this literature, what can we conclude? First and most important, humans are extraordinarily resilient. The Black Plague of the 14th century killed as many as one in four of all Europeans. But eventually, it ran its course and the social structure knitted itself back together. In fact, some historians believe that the European Renaissance was hastened and intensified by the disruptions of the pandemic. Labor shortages led to higher wages. The belief that disease was a visitation of God's wrath could not stand up against the gargantuan death counts. Survivors refocused their lives and many decided to seek pleasures on earth and not wait for a promise of a next world. Instead of using religiosity, deepening relig religiosity, the havoc of the plague emboldened reason and humanism. John Donne's Meditation 17 includes one of the most famous passages in English literature, for whom the bell tolls. Then has two points to make. First, the one thing that unites all of humanity is the commonality of death. If you understand, if you really understand life, the death for someone else today in the form of an obituary, then a tolling church will, is actually about you. Don't kid yourself. Second, we are all in this together and we must find ways to unite and reconcile and commiserate and cooperate if you want to make the best of both the good and the bad of life. Here is the key passage. No human is an island. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sent to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Albert, I'm coming to Albert Kaming, Kamu to about which even Dr. Nikam made a reference. Albert Kamu's masterpiece, The Plague, would make you think and ask all sorts of Socratic questions of yourself and form resolutions how you would intend to make to measure life after getting through this global catastrophe. The play contains the usual elements, initial denial, the unprepared leadership, the attempt to cover up the crisis, to avoid hurting tourism and economy of the town, half-hearted and misguided attempts to stop the spread of the disease, etc. But that is not what Kamu is trying to get at. Kamu is sometimes regarded as one of the 20th century existentialists. But he was more precisely an absurdist. He believed that there is nothing inherently meaningful or 
meaning giving in life that each of us, as he puts it, has to be content to live for the day alone under the vast indifference of the sky. Since for Kamu, there is no life, no afterlife, no heaven or hell. There is no God we can communicate or negotiate with. Each of us is saddled with the burden of constructing a meaningful life. All that Kamu insists upon is truth and, in, and, authentic, and authenticity. According to him, there is a plague in each of us. What we choose to call the plague, in our case, coronavirus or COVID-19, is for Kamu just a very concentrated form of the quintessential human condition, our date with death. Now, after a discussion of how these writers help us diagnose the present malaise, it is natural for everyone to stop and look at constantly increasing death toll every hour, every minute. And perhaps seek an answer. It is quite evident, relevant to mention here that the international dread that created a sustained will we survive and how will we cope conversation in every household is almost over. The question now is when and how and if the country can return to what the late John McCain called the regular order. It is once again here, our literary masters, through their writings, offer some hope and even a sense of solace. It could be in the form of a philosophy on the ephemeral nature of life in general, an exhortation to seek comfort in the lap of mother nature, or even a direct assertion of robust optimism through an ardent faith in the ultimate goodness of God and his divine plan. When Shakespeare's Macbeth says, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing, or Prospero's comment on the finality of life's experience through his oft-quoted line, we are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our life is rounded with a sleep. We are able to forget our immediate context and gracefully accept the final nature of human existence. Although it may sound a little romantic and escapist, the recollection of Wordsworth's daffodils does have an embalming effect on the human heart and their jocund company does provide a bliss to our, to our present state of solitude. Birds and animals have once again started making the presence of their music felt. And all, we also feel like reciting the following words of Shelley to our imaginary skylark. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then as I am listening now. We too, we, we too would like a romantic would we say uh, experience like a romantic. And I'm reminded of the lines he will watch from dawn to gloom, the lake reflected sun illume, the yellow bees in ivy bloom, but from these create he can, forms more real than living man, nurslings of immortality. Robert Browning, the incorrigible robust optimist that he is, would never let us revel in the weariness, the fever and the fret 
of our present state and would like to, would like us to keep reminding ourselves god is in heaven and all is right with the world this too shall pass arnold our friend is aware of the darkling plain engulfing us engulfing us in the present moment but to him the way out lies in successful restoration of human relationships beginning from the personal level and moving beyond perhaps the same idea was echoed by professor vivania also when she talked about all and self the all inclusiveness and not of the binaries as dr nikam talked about and this brings me to quote verbatim a few lines that have remained my favorite all my life from dover beach and they very well sum up the idea of this all inclusiveness beginning at the personal level and then going beyond our love let's be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various so beautiful so new hath really neither joy nor love nor certitude nor help for pain and we are here as on a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night in order to sanitize the virus within life demands of individuals to give it a higher meaning a higher purpose which alone can show the path towards the possible redemption of our present wasteland ts eliot in the final section of the wasteland what the thunder said talks about the three commandments give sympathize and control that the dayad that the dayad one damiat i am referring to the first one giving giving of ourselves that give the awful daring of a moment surrender by this and this alone we have existed we is here the humanity and the awful daring of a moment surrender in that moment great people like christ buddh mahavir and our present day gandhi gave themselves to so life demands of us or from us a higher purpose a higher kind of commitment together with this with what ravindra tagore or his ardent belief in the basic goodness of human beings with heart within and god overhead i think we can sail sail through this catastrophe if not anything these literary glimpses would at least these literary glimpses from our past literary masters would at least arouse among us the feel good factor so necessary to augment our immunity system to combat this situation can we not add it to our list of regular pranayam and surya namaskar that we are being asked to perform every day i think it goes a long way in that direction the discourse would remain incomplete if a word is not addressed to the academia directly without mentioning gayatri spivak's death of a discipline her seminal work showed us how humanities as a discipline 
would vanish from the curriculum of our universities few years from now. If the post-COVID-19 human being is to emerge more sensitive, more empathetic, humanities would once again find a place in our syllabi. It's quite ironical that we needed a pandemic and the sufferings of thousands and lakhs of our migrants who had to walk hundreds of kilometers to reinforce the value of humanities in our system. Long live the humans, long live the humanity in us. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your experiences and articulating the pressing concerns. The classics uh, truly have the ability to lift our spirits and your reference to literary genius like Tennyson, Eliot, Yeats, Rabindranath Tagore was truly meaningful and our participants got a chance to engage with the genre of poetry. Your presentation has helped us to reflect on emotions which are articulated through these verses. And the message of resilience, resilience comes across very powerfully through your presentation. And very significantly, I cherish the message of oneness, which is a panacea to the virus within. So thank you, sir, for sharing your insights. And uh, we will take uh, questions uh, from the participants. If there are any uh, participants can raise their hand and uh, pose a question. They can ask a question to sir or a comment. Uh, yeah, uh, Miss Sunita Singh. Yeah. Kindly unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah good morning, sir. Uh, uh, sorry to say, but I don't know my question is relevant or not, but I want to ask if you give permission. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard, we heard every coin has two aspect. Whatever we have seen and analyzed so far about Corona, mm -hmm. this period of Corona is also giving us different kind of kind experience. Of experience. Mm -hmm. Because it is uh, teaching us many lessons. Uh, actually, we had forgotten, forgotten our limitations, ethics, and spirituality. I want to ask which part of this uh, coin named Corona COVID-19 will be more weighted uh, while writing about this uh, period? Uh, if you have listened to uh, my discourse, uh, you must have seen that it talks about the external manifestation as well as the virus within. So, and the virus within, if we can combat that, if we can cheer up our spirits, have a certain level of positivity, perhaps half the battle is already won. When post-COVID literature is written, it will dwell on among other things, a number of things, it will also talk about the inner state of human beings experiencing, experiencing this pandemic. But personally, I feel that the inner self, the emotional state, the psychological state, that is far more important in the present juncture, in the middle that we are in, to which I referred. And perhaps a great amount of literature would dwell on this, write poems on this, write novels on this. And even psychologists would have a lot of job to do in the post-COVID age. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was very stimulating. Thank you very much, sir. Thank You're you, welcome. There's another question by Patrick, can you unmute yourself? 
Hello, uh, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Um, uh, I don't know how relevant it is to the session you've given, but I would like to know that, uh, see, I'm coming from a technical institute where we teach uh, English uh, language and literature as well for students. But um, uh, I feel that uh, the humanities as such, especially literature is given less important nowadays in uh, technical institutes and engineering college colleges. So how can we like um, connect with the management and show them that, you know, literature is also a vital and important part of uh, life and is very relevant as well today. Uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, uh, your question is uh, very, very uh, relevant in the present context because in the last 20, 25 years, uh, we have had, uh, you know, people from science and technology questioning the very idea of keeping humanities as a discipline in the formal curricula. That's why towards the end of my lecture, I mentioned Gayatri Swarak's you know, seminal work, death of his discipline. She was talking about the death of this discipline, humanities. Mm -hmm. And you know, now that the inner man becomes more important, his feelings become more important. Mm -hmm. The individual, the, the camera is shifting from the scientific advancement at the external level to the inner man. And obviously, when we talk about the inner man, his emotions and his feelings become important. And there comes the role of humanities and literature. Uh -huh. I said, ironically, we need a pandemic to emphasize this. But yeah. the lesson has come the hard way. And I believe all the you know people who sit in the educational management systems and the policy makers would now give it a renewed approach, think afresh and incorporate humanities and dis literature as a part of our technical and management courses in particular. I think I'm, I've made my clear, my, my idea clear. Yes, sir. It was very clear. Thank you for your very influential session. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, another question by Fani Kumari. Um, you can ask your question. Uh, yes, good morning, sir. Uh, sir good morning. Uh, uh, my question is, nowadays all the people, they are encouraging trauma literature, sir. Mm -hmm. It is always awful and suffering. Mm -hmm. And if we encourage the type of trauma literature, how can we get a positive attitude about the present scenario? And uh, you have told that uh, we have to kill the virus inside. Mm -hmm. And how can, uh, uh, as we get agony about other people and the labor, uh, how can we get, how can we kill the virus inside, sir? If we think about others suffering. Ms. Bani Gumari, thank you for a very, very relevant question once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, you talk about the suffering of others. Yes. I talked about the emergence of a post-COVID COVID man who is going to be more sensitive and more empathetic. Yes, sir. When he's going to be more empathetic, obviously, the discourse on positivity, the discourse on optimism, the discourse on, on empathizing with the sufferings of others is, go is going to become far far more important. That is why the second part of my lecture was devoted to all those writers who help us reinforce the hope in us, give us solace, give us comfort. In your suffering, I empathize, I sympathize. I, I, I alluded to T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. He talks about the three commandments or he talks about threefold ways in which man can uplift himself out of this 
situation, this gory situation, wasteland-like situation. He talked about give, sympathize, and control. I just concentrated on give. It's good that you raise this question now. I'm coming to the second commandment, Dayadvam. Dayadvam means sympathize. What Eliot wants to say there is you emotionally and imaginatively enter into the lives and problems of others and understand them. While when I, whenever I teach the wasteland, which is one of my favorite books for all for more than three decades now, and I read it as an annual ritual. When I teach the second commandment, Dayadvam, I am always reminded of a beautiful line from one of the prayers, oft quoted prayers of Mahatma Gandhi. When you understand the pain of and sufferings of others, when you identify with them, you have to enter imaginatively into the lives and problems of others. And only then you can sympathize and empathize. And I believe in the post-COVID literature, there are going to be poems, novels, plays galore on these subjects. Does that answer your question? Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, your presentation is wonderful, sir. No, Thank you for giving this opportunity. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, Another question by uh, Mr. Prakash. Kindly unmute yourself, Mr. Prakash. You can ask a question. Prakash, yes, go ahead, ask your question. Cannot hear you. Uh, you can type your question in the chat box. You're not audible, Mr. Prakash. Yeah, I'm not able to hear you, Mr. Yes. Prakash. We are not able to hear you, Mr. Prakash. Could you type your question in the chat box? Uh, in the meantime, sir, we'll take a question uh, which appeared on the YouTube. Uh, how is literature going to help us sustain this pandemic? There's one question. How is literature going to help us to sustain this pandemic? And another one, uh, what do you think about science fiction? Is it relevant to the present situation? Uh, there are two questions that you have asked. Yes. Uh, yes. They, have, they have been asked by the viewers and the participants. Yes. Uh, and both are, I believe, uh, very valid questions in one way or the other. Uh, the whole uh, discourse was on the relevance of literature uh, in understanding our present predicament or present situation. And uh, you have uh, the uh, you have the first part wherein you try to diagnose the malice and the second part wherein you try to find some kind of a way out or a solution for your salvation. And it's not specific only to this pandemic. Such a situation has been in existence in the past. And man has, as I said, is human beings, human beings are quite resilient. And they have the capacity to, to face anything and come out. But literature, to those who are sensitive, to those what we in Hindi or Sanskrit call saraday, responds and gives an answer. Why do we sing songs? Why do we recite poems? Why do we play instruments? After all, even for a temporary moment, even for a temporary period, it does give us a relief. Maybe, why I say temporary? Because we cannot remain in that state of escape for a long time. I, I talked about the imaginary skylark. I can also talk about the world of the nightingale. 
the nightingale poem ode ends on was it a vision or a waking dream fled is the music do i wake or sleep but at least i mean ultimately we have to return to the dull realities of human existence but for for some time this poem which is a part a masterpiece of you know one of the famous odes of john keats in a masterpiece in literature it does give us that kind that sense of eternal joy that ex, that we experience in nature and it's going to be there everywhere every time in every age so in that sense literature is quite and has remained relevant it will remain relevant it's all for us to have that kind of sensitivity within to see that the second question we talked about the relevance of science fiction you see i uh, these days when you see uh, people could imagine that a virus could be you know engineered in a laboratory well people say why why we why why should we have i mean science it talks about the it, it talks about one of the ill effects of science but look at the beauty of science it is science which is making us possible connect with with each other during this webinar is the technology so there are two sides of it so science fiction will have its relevance more right uh, writers would write on this but with a different view after all reason and emotion they have to go hand in hand if science is a tool at the hands of reason emotion is another tool at the hands of literature so they are they have to go together and do their respective job so don't worry about uh, science fiction let it do its job more writers will come they will talk about other things we will have other kinds of pandemics and we'll continue to battle and literature will, will always give us the solace and the comfort necessary to battle with this kind of crisis i think i'm clear now to both of them yes sir thank you so much sir you are welcome thank you for your valuable message and for your enlightening session uh, and i'm sure our viewers have enjoyed and you've taken them on a trip of poetry so we are very grateful to you for uh, gracing this occasion for giving us your insights thank you very much sir we now move on uh, thank you so but, much thank you everybody for giving me a patient hearing and encouraging thank you welcome uh, we now move on to, uh, to the next plenary session uh, which is by professor dr r p singh uh, i'm honored to introduce uh, professor dr r p singh dr r p singh is a professor of english at the department of english and modern european languages university of lucknow he is an award winning playwright poet and an academician He has twenty-eight books, hundred and eight research papers, hundred and five invited lectures, presentations and conferences and seminars, and four hundred foreign assignments to his credit. He has guided nineteen PhDs and thirty-nine MPhil scholars, and completed five research projects funded from UGC, ICSSR, ICPR, and ICCR. He has been the member of board of studies of approximately ten universities and institutions across India, and the chairman of curriculum committee of English for CBSC, New Delhi. Professor Singh has worked as NAC peer team member and has also been a consultant to several foreign publication houses. His writings are published from leading international publications like Oxford University Press, Sage, Blackwell, Macmillan, and many more. as a creative writer his plays have received critical acclaim and wide popularity in the year 2006 he received dr ambedkar fellowship award and in 2011 he received dr baba saheb prize for excellence in 2015 the shikshak shri samman was conferred on him by the government of uttar pradesh for innovations in teaching 
and commendable contribution to higher education. His creative genius won him several accolades and awards, to name a few, Mohan Rakesh Puraskar, Saraswat Samman, SM Sinha Smriti Award, and Bharatindu Harishchandra Award. And in 2020, he was conferred with the Swami Vivekanand Youth Lifetime Achievement Award for his contribution to the fields of English and Hindi creative writing. So we are truly honored to have you amidst us and I'm sure your session will give valuable insights to all the participants. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Madam Coordinator, for introducing me. I extend my heartiest greetings to uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor, the Principal of the College, Professor Nikam Sudhir Nikam, the Chairman Board of Studies, Mumbai University, the coordinators, the organizers, and the esteemed resource person, uh, Professor Suresh Srivastoji, Madam. Kumiyas Vabaina and the learned audience uh, joining this session across the country. I feel myself as a creative writer during the time of COVID than a student of literature. I'm simply observing the things around, writing on them and uh, thinking about what shape the literature is going to take in future. It is too early, uh, I, I, I mean to say, it is too early to say what shape the literature will take in future because still the menace of COVID, the pandemic is not over. This morning, I got a message from uh, my university that one of my colleague has, uh, is, he is uh, affected by this pandemic and he has been sent to Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute. He is in isolation and he lost his father uh, two days back um, due to this um, uh, this uh, COVID-19. So when we look beyond our doors, when we uh, peep outside, when we read newspaper, so the state of mind that we have, is that state of mind, uh, what shape that creativity, what shape of that criticism is going to take this is still a thing, it is too early to predict about the literature. In this context of uh, uh, COVID, friends, we are meeting here today when anxiety is almost saturated. We are meeting the phase when the life is deriding towards an unknown direction. We are meeting at a time when what the tomorrow will be is not sure to us this shape, I will not be talking about the great masters of literature. I will not uh, be talking about the great theorist of literature because when there is uh, this type of disaster towards humanity, for humanity, when we are in peril, so we look something, the nitty gritty, the small aspects that are uh, prevailing, that are found in our scenario in our vicinity. I will be talking rather about the mini discourses. I will rather be talking about the mini narratives emerging out of popular culture, emerging out of folklore, emerging out of uh, what we call the uh, little uh, sources of knowledge, literature and culture. Friends, as the introduction of my talk uh, in the very introduction phase, as I write the passage, I would like to read a poem that I wrote this morning because um, uh, during the phase of lockdown, I'm totally engrossed in my creativity and I'm writing that. So uh, with the many scholarly discourses, I would like to offer you something uh, creative. Uh, Professor Srivastava, sir, uh, I would like you to, uh, <laughs> to uh, please listen to this <laughs> and uh, comment on that, how the poem is. This is uh, 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 the, this small English poem. Let us resist to confer. Let us resist to confer, dismantle, disheartened and tired. They refuse to claim any shape, a form, tacit, and quarrel so often indeed. 
the blueprint of thought and the cohesive art bruised up values emerged yet masked several black blue light crafted and morphed shades pictures girls and forms don't you see news the catastrophe where lies veracity the real yes the real in the sense a beleaguered spirit busy setting the cacophonic charts letters move to street letters move to street and flensing the face that facing you fading the glance letters move to sex and letters move to self letters move to tales that are overheard don't you see letters let's see letters your spirit your weight in words enormity and flow letters see the mask and see the face let us see the mask and see the face i'm sure power you carry any idea to unearth any nugget unseen even verses unsung let us don't resist to confront so uh, this is a poem uh, i wrote this morning uh, as an introduction to my talk today because this is a very informal talk um, uh, and uh, uh, this discusses my state of mind as a student of literature as a writer as an observer of society around what happens what uh, covid 19 has uh, created what covid 19 is going to give us what going uh, covid 19 is going to take out of us and how we are going to combat covid 19 this all uh, uh, i want to express through this now uh, i would like to discuss because uh, uh, i will not touch upon any great master i will uh, be talking about as i told you uh, that uh, the mini narratives i will be talking about the process of writing literature the state of mind when literature is being written and how the uh, this pandemic is going to uh, uh, give something steal something associate something like that so uh, when we start literature when we uh, take up to experiment with literature how literature emerges it is a very uh, prevalent phenomena very prevalent phenomena quite old phenomena we all know that literature comes out of deviation this may be positive deviation this may be negative deviation good bad critical anything we have uh, uh, we have understood we have studied the concept of anubhav vibhav sanchari bhav how the ras emerges out of this okay so this uh, is the deviation we were living a very happy life we were celebrating uh, january we were going to uh, celebrate basant panchami suddenly the news comes that covid had uh, covid outbreak is there in our country and we are now uh, we uh, i remember that uh, um, before holy vacation we were uh, holding regular class in the university of, uh, at our university but up suddenly uh, i uh, we got a notice that uh, the classes are suspended uh, for the students and we are not having any congregation we are not going to have any meeting uh, around so this deviation comes such type of deviation is for uh, not for the teachers uh, students uh, like us but for everyone the laborers are going to the uh, shift suddenly the thekedar uh, comes suddenly the contractors come the boss comes uh, you are not going to come uh, from tomorrow the machine is going to stop and uh, our business is going to stop the poor laborers are stuck so uh, suddenly auto rickshaw driver they are told that uh, no uh, there will be no transport from tomorrow and they are going uh, they, uh, for for the sake of their livelihood they are going to do anything uh, which is not the um uh, practice in past okay so this is the deviation and this deviation takes literature into action any type of it it, it gives the seed of literature so this is the deviation this deviation gives us 
struggle we try to struggle and in that struggle in that phase of struggle the cohesion is there and that gives us force the energy to sustain this energy is very big and uh, it is the metaphor again that of the bee and butterfly who can retain that energy to produce something for the betterment of society for the betterment of humanity and for doing something creative thing like like uh, this is a very popular uh, statement we uh, do often use this in our classroom that a creative writer is just like a bee a uh, layman is like a butterfly the bee and butterfly they have the same habitat ultimately the bee produces something for the sake of uh, humanity okay so this is the this energy how we are going to sustain that energy and how we are going to channelize that energy into the uh, phase of our creation into the patterns of our creation and what trajectory that is going to take this is uh, uh, this is the experience this experience this uh, takes to the practitioners into the uh, experiencing of the situation around okay so this uh, covid 19 that is uh, uh, we are looking at this covid 19 at uh, this outbreak this has given a different kind of uh, um, different kind of so you can say molding the wave of uh, thought these are institutional uh, molding these are the selfish molding by selfish motive these are the moldings by the altruistic forces these are by, uh, for the sake of fame for the sake of market for the sake of religion for the sake of profession so literature if we think about literature the creativity uh, uh, creativity in this phase are uh, the phase to come it is going to be institutionalized it is not going to take a regular course it is going to be seen from different angles people who are in power people who are in periphery different kind of politics different kind of uh, situational understanding different kind of temperament different kind of uh, uh, understanding of the situation is going to be reflected in literature of uh, covid time the literature um, that is being written over here further the next point that comes to my mind is that what type of literature is being created what type of literature is being written during the time of this corona pandemic this phase that we are having uh, what type of situation uh, normally because uh, i have been uh, collecting the scripts from social media from the small uh, newspapers magazines online journals portals from the messages of our friends and i have a collection of more than th uh, 300 such scripts they may be the jokes they may be the fun they may be the memes they may be the comments they may be uh, any, anything like any form because literature in the present scenario is not only the classical literature it is the literature that has crossed the barriers of the um, meta culture the mini culture that has crossed the barriers of the high culture the low culture so from that perspective uh, everything uh, may come i have Uh, to my understanding this may be my subjective reasoning this may be uh, my subjective understanding i have put i have understood literature from uh, two perspective the literature that is being produced and the literature that is being evolved uh, it is my solely subjective uh, statement um, it is still to be researched and uh, the comments are sought from the learned scholars around the literature that is being produced this is uh, governed by the market force it is governed by the market force the editors the publishers our own friends i have uh, got invitation from more than 5 6 editors of anthologies they said that we are going to publish an anthology of Uh, quarantine poems we are going to uh, produce publish edit something on that kindly give me uh, some poems of yours okay and you give me tomorrow you give me after okay so this is going to be market driven force this is going to be a literature that is being produced 
and this is not evolving from ourselves. If you start writing, you may find time. Suppose you may find a flare that you are writing ten poems in a day. You are finding, uh, and there may be the situation that you are not able to write even a single poem for two months, three months. You are not write, able to write a story for one year. You may have a chance to write. Uh, one fine morning, I share with you uh, my. I started writing a, a play webinar because uh, there was compulsion from uh, many people around, even from different institutions, that you uh, go for a webinar, you listen to this webinar, uh, uh, write, uh, speak on some webinar. And uh, that uh, I, I, I talked to the students that how what is your perception about webinar? It was a mixed response. It was a mixed response. I wrote a, a small skit for the students. Uh, I could write more than 15 pages in one hour. I scribbled them. But after uh, it is now semi finished, it's not finished. Uh, because I could not uh, get that energy, that flair to write. Uh, so uh, why I'm telling you this incident from my personal life? Because uh, I, I tell you, that I, I'm going to share with you uh, that what I understand, the literature is either evolved or produced. Uh, if we look at the life and times of many writers, we find that it is, uh, in many cases, the editors have produced uh, the writers. The magazines, the journals have produced the writer because they make them write. They make them write, especially in Hindi writing. The uh, writings of uh, the uh, early magazines of Hindi, they have produced many good essays in Hindi. Achar Mahavir Prasad Devedi, maybe there, um, uh, there uh, Hajari Prasad Devedi is there. Even in the case of periodical writing, the situations have um, uh, have moved the writer to write uh, and to uh, translate the situation, the scenario into the written pieces. So uh, the first, uh, again, uh, the, pro the, the literature that is produced, this is uh, driven by the market forces. This is driven by the institutions. And this is transitory in nat nature. Because if you are forced to do something, then you are not getting your real self. Then this is also institutionalized. Who is offering you to write the literature? What kind of magazine, to what kind of journal you are uh, submitting your piece of writing? Do you want to write a poem on Corona that is talking about the policy of the institution? Or are you going to write something that is talking about the plight of the laborers? Are you going to talk about this issue from the version of those who are in power or those who are uh, not in power? So this is the produced literature. The literature that is evolved, that is your intrinsic self, that is the real self. It is the true account of your own negotiation. The moment you negotiate yourself with the forces outside, yourself is always negotiating. You are finding different type of uh, uh, pressures from different forces. How do you negotiate? And this is uh, a kind of struggle. There is a very famous essay, Cadence, Country and Silence. We have our own urge, we have our own self, we have our own cadence. The country, the surrounding that is given to us. The time where we are doing to negotiate. And then the silence. This silence has two faces, the positive silence and the negative silence. Even if we achieve something, we are happy and we are silent after celebrating that success. If we are unhappy, we are sad. How long shall we weep? How long shall we uh, mourn over that? We, it will take some time and we will get sad. 
okay so this is the uh, uh, discourse of the internal and the external forces the literature that is evolved this is not institutionalized this is the free flow of thoughts and emotions this is the free flow of thought and emotions this is the understanding of our own self and this is a response to your own us if you are entering into that literature that is evolved you can talk about the shloka of valmiki when he saw the crunch bird and then how the how it came to um, uh, to the mind of uh, sage valmiki and he started writing the shloka uh, that is shloka okay so this is when you are driving sometimes you are you are driving towards your place of work in bed uh, on the way you find a beautiful uh, scene you find a painful scene you find any scene and then you start you just stop your uh, car you stop uh, your vehicle and you write some points on your notepad on your uh, slip anything that you have and then you go ahead this is the uh, writing the literature that is uh, to be evolved and these two literatures these two forces are equally working during the time of uh, covid 19 during the time when we are sitting back at home and we are working from our home we are uh, sometimes forced to write and sometimes we are evolved because um, uh, some uh, we are very much on telephonic uh, talk with our friends and many of our friends they say that i have got two type i am also um, uh, thinking much about what type of response our friends our uh, students our own people give sometimes they say how are you i'm good uh kaise hain kya chal raha hai uh, how are you feeling time hi time hai aap baat nahi karte hain then you you how can you explain that time hi time hai but in this time how what what shape the time is taking what, what uh, do you have any uh, what rallies of thought are coming to your mind what rallies of thought are uh, going outside okay there are people who say there no time we have lot to do we are uh, doing a i i know a medical doctor um, and he said that he has translated 400 pages uh, of a very old book during the time of covid he is a medical doc- doctor a professor of anatomy but he is translating from urdu to english and he has done 400 pages more than 400 pages uh, during this uh, corona time so uh, this is what uh, at the time Uh, the uh, time of uh, pandemic is taking us towards our creativity our writing uh further if we go ahead in this direction so we can say that literature and change they have a very interesting very complex relationship literature brings change and also change brings literature there are many meta text on pandemic we can also even we can remember uh, uh, professor sivastav sir has given lot of uh, discourses from uh, the literary text we can easily remember april is the cruelest month breeding lilacs out of the dead hand dead land mixing memory and desire stirring the roots uh, with spring rain these lines of wasteland T.S. Eliot and his wife, they were quarantined. Um, it was, uh, you know, uh, the Spanish flu and uh, they were quarantined. It is said that the Spanish flu was very deadly. More than a million people uh, died during that. And uh, T.S. Eliot and uh, uh, his wife, both of them, they were quarantined in the month of December. When they came up in uh, March, so most of the part of this work was uh, done in uh, 19... Uh, at that time he was writing so uh, april he came to uh, help he he enjoyed his full bloom help the month of uh, um, later april so he write april is the cruelest uh, cruelest man lot of a uh, lot of things are there you can click just click on internet uh, you will find lot of books around based on quarantine lot of books that refer to pandemic Uh, i have searched uh, more than 100 titles in this way you will see the poem the novel the drama the 
uh, text on the popular culture, the cinema, everything is there. Uh, it can be uh, also a matter of research for us in future. So uh, I was talking about literature and change. Literature can bring change and change also brings literature. Change creates literature because uh, as I, told, I have discussed earlier also in the beginning of this talk that literature comes out of deviation. The deviation gives us the thought. So uh, meta text on pandemic are quite available. Very uh, meta text uh, means uh, the text uh, on pandemic, the text on uh, disasters. Maybe uh, you can start with the uh, the Decameron. Uh, you can talk about the Black Death down to uh, the 21st century, down to um, and ranging from literary text down to the popular culture, folk culture, everywhere you have even uh, I got uh, interested to uh, search for the text on pandemic in folklore. I, I come, I hail from North India. I'm here from uh, Lucknow. Authi is the dialect. Authi is the dialect. I talk to many uh, people uh, in uh, the villages and they said, I, I said that, uh, tell me if you know any text that talks about any disease, tell me anything. So um, I met a person, he, his name is Jawaharlal, and he hails from Basti district of Uttar Pradesh. Jawaharlal has given me, uh, he narrated, he's a very old man, a uh, senior citizen he is, and uh, he is uh, in uh, 80s, and he uh, sung five, six songs that are concerning Haija. Haija is cholera in the villages they have. So pandemic text are easily available. I met a person from Gajipur district of Uttar Pradesh, uh, that is the Bhospuri heartland. And they had also many similar texts uh, in their dialect. And uh, they said that um, uh, uh, everything is being sung. This is also, uh, this may also be a matter of discussion, a uh, dialogue uh, in uh, researches in our uh, paper, uh, in uh, the context of uh, this COVID, in the context of uh, this uh, pandemic that is going. One thing more that comes to my mind when we listen to uh, the media, when we, when, we, uh, when we refer to the text, on uh, different sides. Corona is a war. This is, we are in the phase of war. So maybe that we are writing the literature like war poems, war literature. Why it is war? Why it is war? War is a metaphor. This metaphor, the moment we say that, uh, okay, we are now into war. So that gives us inner strength. That gives us the force to go that gives the force to the individual, to the society, and to the nation also. It gives us the history to profess. During the time of war, uh, if you talk about the warfare from the ancient civilizations, uh, uh, you, you start from the Indus Valley civilization, Aryan civilization to Mesopotamia, anywhere you go, you will find that uh, uh, prophecy and thing and uh, scriptural literature writing, they are all very much associated with war. And war gives us a momentum. War gives us a momentum to do, go ahead. War gives us a momentum to um, sustain, to proclaim, to resist, to give us strength and to um, stand in uh, a mood to combat the external force. So this is a metaphor. War metaphor is very uh, is very much used for this uh, corona time. Uh, when we talk about uh, the trajectory of post COVID literature, because uh, the uh, the topic of this um, uh, this uh, this seminar is reflections on post COVID literature scenario. Post COVID literature scenario. It is, I, I told you that it is too early to speak on, uh, it is too early to speak on uh, the scenario of uh, post-COVID because the battle is not yet to 
um, it is over it is not over we are fighting and uh, there are many messages on our social media uh, channels the uh, the battle is yet to win the corona has not uh, taken the lockdown away the corona it is still uh, dancing in the street the corona uh, is still um, in the uh, parks that thing, that, that thing. so um, in this situation what type of literature is going to emerge in the post covid 19 phase this is not yet decided it we, it is too early I, this is my sub, this is my uh, this is my uh, view subjective view and i uh, i uh, find that it is not it is too early to decide what shape the literature is going to take it will depend on whether we are going to be victorious are we are going to be victorious, losing our arsenals? We are going to be losers. Are we are going to be victorious and losers both? Some of us we are going to be victorious. Some of us we are going to be losers. Many things are many many equations are going to emerge. We are and what type of shape what type of uh, what what type of uh, understanding what type of state of mind we shall be uh, into uh, when we shall be uh, overcoming uh, this the corona time i give you two references from history indian history uh, most of my talks are uh, related to uh, the most portion of part of my, the of my talk is related to indian history because uh, that is that is uh, real to us. We are not uh, able to feel what is happening in America. Only we can feel um, via uh, news channels and other things. Um, so there is uh, the reference of we can find the reference of Samrat Asok. Samrat Asok's culling victory. He became victor uh, victorious. He won the scenario. Samrat Ashok won the scenario, he won the um, uh, battle, but he became, he, he said that, what shall we do? What is the, uh, because the cops are lying there, uh, the massacre is there, and he became, uh, he got into Buddhism. He, he, he took the uh, farm, he, he took the uh, course of peace, and he became a uh, uh, kind of you can say says king this is this is um this is uh, uh samrat ashok and then we can uh, also have samudra gupt there is a very famous script in indian cultural text samudra gupt prashasti samudra gupt vanquished many rulers across the uh, country and then he uh, he uh, he uh, then um, mentioned that on many pillars, he did it in Prasasti, and many writers, poets uh, are uh, dealt with that. This is, these are two paradigms that I'm looking at. One paradigm that of Samudra the other paradigm that of Ashoka. Ashoka got everything, but he was not in a position to enjoy that in that pattern as the emperors and kings are going to enjoy samudra gupta got everything he, he became a victor and then he enjoyed that and uh, it is still prevalent in our uh, so uh, further we can say that the way of looking at corona pandemic it will be our political stand uh, when it will be our political stand in our country and in the world politics. Who is going to dominate the world after Corona pandemic? The literature will be governed by the policies and the patterns of that. This is a very bold statement and many of us may agree, may not agree, but we are also uh, feeling it. We can say that there is a lot of rampant pattern of cultural colonization. Who creates literature, whose literature is published, whose literature is being taught in the universities, those who are in power. So 
uh, the literature after corona will take two stands. Uh, it, it is also, there are two trajectories that are, are coming up. The trajectory of uh, our political stand and the trajectories of the polarization of the world after the corona. This is, uh, these are the conjectures, these are the thoughts that I, I, I put um, into my head when I uh, think about the literature in post-corona phase. Again, if uh, uh, I was talking, I was talking to many friends around, uh, many of my students, they are also writing poems and they are sharing their poems with me that, uh, sir, please read my work and uh, uh, comment on that. I want to get them published. So uh, while talking to such authors around, I have seen a linear pattern of creativity and literature. I have grasped, I have understood four different steps in that way. The first phase is trauma, unrest, ennui, that takes to looking around, that takes to self-discovery. And this self-discovery and looking around is taking us into the form of the urge. What type of urge? Leisure time, alternative mode of expressing ourselves, the fun, reading, and this leads to what patterns of creativity we are going to have. The narratives of literature we are going to have, we are going to have the discourses, thoughts, we are creating many texts, and this gives us the power of resilience. From the trauma to resilience, this journey is um, pervading. And in this journey, different steps are coming. And uh, these steps are uh, going to give us power to sustain via creation. Uh, I... Um, I have got uh, some poems I, I shared with you. I, I got some poems uh, um, from different sources, more than uh, several hundred poems I've got. Some students tell, uh, send their work to me and uh, they keep on sending from my students, they are research scholars, my friends, younger friends, uh, senior friends. Uh, what I have observed, I have put that into four different phases. This is also um, a research in making. This is also my observation. It is my pilot work. So I have had a close watch on literature, on screen, in periodicals, and I have put them into four different phases. The first phase of enthusiasm. The second phase of paradox. The third phase of negotiation. And the fourth phase that is continuously running in the current time is the phase of introspection. Even in my writing, I'm finding myself going through this channel. The first phase of enthusiasm, the lockdown was there. Uh, it, it is something about uh, when lockdown was there in our country. And a little before that, I was attending all India English uh, Teachers Conference, and there were many, uh, at that time, uh, I got many comic scripts, I got many jokes on Corona. What is Corona? There was a, there was a very beautiful girl named Corona, that Corona is not dangerous. There was a picture, we, all of us may, we must have shared that on a um, uh, WhatsApp screen. Uh, so what is Corona? Uh, many of us, we were also talking about uh, different patterns of Corona across the uh, nation, not from, from a country, in other countries, and how we how we are going to do that. Okay, so this is this is the phase of enthusiasm. People started writing, "Hami marenge, wo chale jayenge," like uh, the famous Lucknowi quote, "Ki um, Lucknow pe uh, Angrejo ka uh, oh, attack ho raha tha, us samay to uh, hamare nawabon ne kaha ki bhai bajaa saaj." Uh, Baja, 
तो उसने बजाना शुरू कर दिया हम ही मारेंगे वो चले जाएंगे तो दिस केस इज इट इन स्टार्ट आई रीड अ पोएम फ्रॉम दिस फेस ये पोएम इट वाज पब्लिश्ड इन भुवनेश्वर रिव्यू स्टे होम एंड स्टे सेफ आई हैव कलेक्टेड फोर पोएम्स दैट रिप्रेजेंट दीज फोर फेजेस ऑफ कोरोना पैंडेमिक इन अ कंट्री the the first phase is a phase of enthusiasm the phase of uh, we were taking it very lightly vividly even i wrote many poems and i got them published in amar ujala and many other newspapers and uh, in bonesh or you also in the the wall wall i published some of them so uh, stay home and stay safe this is a very beautiful poem uh, by um, uh, published in bonesh or you see the dangerous cordons of war the enemy stands concealed afar blowing beating trumpets and horns see burning it moves over planet green had it been a visible for we in unison would have often so wicked and rascal this peril sanguine robbing you jobs our planet green let it die for a human glance stay back to keep world safe corona is circling close isolation our weapon shop stay home and stay safe from covid 19 keep world safe so this is an uh, in a very ideal situation we are thinking about a very ideal situation and we think that it is just like a zukam bukhar swine flu one of my this scholar um, uh, she uh, uh, comes from a family of doctors and she said that sir darne ki zarurat nahi hai Uh, ये तो सभी फ्लू की तरह है आ जाएगा चला जाएगा कोई बात नहीं है लेकिन अब मैंने आज सुबह व्हेन दिस मॉर्निंग आई आई सॉ द न्यूज दैट वन ऑफ माय कलीग इज सफरिंग फ्रॉम सो वी आर लिटिल स्केट भाई जुकाम बुखार है कि उसका कोई बड़ा चीज है दिस इज थिंग दिस इज अ लाइट एम टोन द सेकंड फेज दैट आई एम रेफरिंग टू हियर दिस इज द पैराडॉक्स वी वेरी in we were in an ideal position that okay it is going to be a very simple way, thing like that in second phase i will read a poem a small poem because the uh, time is running short i think this is now 12:30 and um, uh, my time uh, uh, madam organizer can i take uh, 10 more minutes okay yes sir okay ma'am thank you uh this poem i have uh, just taken from the instagram account of a writer war time by jar satish there are profiters in the cupboard there are thieves in the neat head grows there are the rumors and the alarms it's the times we live in they say darling these are days of anxiety listen to the high pitched call of small birds kiss me one more poem is there how people are negotiating the uh, disease how people are this is why why are swing uh, uh, please don't decorate me in garlands don't give me applause spare me recognition for work injury martyrdom or any other merits i didn't come to wuhan to admire the cherry blossoms and i didn't come to the scenery the reception of flattery i just want to return home safe when the epidemic ends even if all that remains are my bones i must bring myself home to my children and my parents the phase of paradox and the third phase what i name here as negotiation the phase of negotiation i will read my own poem this is published in a journal online journal uh, a helter skelter and some rage flashes the news on channels and youtube the worn out screen that flashes the flesh in night so frequent rushing comes raju from work to chat come brother come mehtab kallu and firoz come nannu tirat and jamil these are all laborers from my own vicinity they i know all of them uh, some in snooze and tired some others there still fatigued face money is gone and the shack too 
the trains are stopped and the buses full far off east how to reach um, they were working in mumbai uh, and from mumbai they have to come back to uh, the barabanki district of uttar pradesh how and they are calling they are managing even some called me that uh, you are working in a university maybe you could uh, stand some help to me uh, okay that for us is how to reach families uncle nephews and other there a world of our own spreads corona is killing cries unheard causes unknown just curses galore just curses galore nation fighting in full staff force leaders leading at every post calamity conscious act of the need our courage our forces are passed on test okay this is long poem so i am reading some lines from this this is the page of negotiation how do we negotiate with the reality how do we negotiate with the things around and the the current phase is the phase of introspection this is a biggest example of introspection madam that you are organizing a, a, a seminar uh, on this uh, webinar on this reflections on post covid literary scenario we have, and uh, one of the chief ministers uh, has said that now let's learn to live with corona and everywhere uh, the people are roaming the street they are enjoying they are doing the thing so this phase 4 is the shape of negos introspection the casualties are increasing um, it is the state of lull and we are still waiting for a tomorrow what type of tomorrow it will be there we uh, in the morning we look at the screen we look at the mobile what message is coming to us a shape i saw it blasted past you know the nightmare the spring past a chain of cues and lures of skew the thoughts yet conceived to thought a vacuum that still they see it is space to color and to confer to proceed or to recede nightmare puts the quizzes on the turns are yet recollecting the plan this slumber deep and the ears so deaf see the shape it bleeds so uh, uh, in nutshell what forms i see uh, when i look at the uh, post covid scenario of uh, this uh, situation i can say uh, i can see that uh, we are going to see hundreds of phd and mphil students enroll in next year the moment we will recover from this uh, disaster we will start working writing papers we will start uh, guiding thesis on corona literature on covid literature like pandemic literature we shall look beyond we shall look before we shall associate we shall negotiate the earlier pandemic text we shall start looking at that and the publishers are ready i got um, i will not name the publisher but uh, he sent Uh, an offer that you may publish your book with us and during the lockdown uh, time uh, we are giving you 50% discount in the uh, routine time we publish uh, 100 page book for this much money and now uh, we are publishing uh, and that and i have uh, as i told you in the beginning that uh, many editors have approached that you write corona poem and we will guide uh, them we will take them for our discussion in future so how the literature is created and how the literature is utilized and how the literature is managed how the literature is politicized everything will uh, come uh, we shall have anthology of papers we shall have the collection of poems we shall have many novels we shall have deco- uh, documentary we will have many uh, movies uh, cinema etc and they will be um, they will be oriented from two different perspective you know those who are in power those who are uh, not in power um, how i see the literature it is going to be innovative it is going to be interdisciplinary it will see how culture creates and transforms individual experience everyday life and social relation it is going to be politically engaged also this is a taboo uh, rather in uh, talking about politics in academia but it is we you know, people who are, who are going to discuss this thing because uh, only academic academician uh, ca- uh, will raise this voice it is going to be politically engaged what is uh, this disease and how the literature is being written it is going to blend 
much with pop culture because we can't deny the force of social media we can't deny the force of popular culture how they are taking how they are taking up this disease how the people who are and uh, who are um, in the elitist um, pa paradigm how they are taking up this thing and different genres and trends are to be questioned different genres are to be questioned so we uh, may have i sometimes see that uh, maybe uh, we are going to have a post post modern scenario uh, we are going to uh, have uncanny we are going to have uh, post human uh, description what type of literature we are going to have what type of different it will be a collage it will be a pastiche and we shall have a different layers of carnivalus the celebration of your power the your victory the plight um, हम जीतेंगे तो टूट कर जीतेंगे कि हम जीतेंगे तो शान से जीतेंगे इसका भी फर्क होगा डिफरेंट थिंग्स आर कमिंग टू आर फ्यूचर एंड वी आर गोइंग टू फेस दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डू दैट सो विद दिस आई एंड माय टॉक एंड माय सबमिशन इज देयर द लिटरेचर इज गोइंग टू मे बी इट इज ऑल्सो इट इज वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग फीलिंग टू मी that whether we are going to challenge the genres we are going to challenge the movements that trends also or not maybe we are going to again uh, write start writing like romantic writers have done because we have seen uh, the life when the first page of corona was there we were looking at our balance uh, bank balance and then see that okay what can we see because we are we are go, we are not able to buy uh, the green vegetable we are not going to uh, we are not able to go to market we are not going to go to malls so the basic thing uh, a packet of 5 kilo atta a packet of 5 uh, kilo chawal some alu some pyaaz and uh, some uh, tail uh, the, the cooking medium this is the sugar this is the basic necessities so are we going to celebrate our uh, life to the base are we going to so this is the thing um i do listen at the knock of romantic writing romantic literature may come up and the literature what shape it will come as as uh, our learned uh, colleagues have already discussed the second coming what shall be that second coming it is still blurred for me thank you so much uh, scholars friends um colleagues uh, students connecting on this channel thank you so much um over to you ma'am thank you sir <coughs> if participants have some questions they can uh, raise their hand we'll take a few questions there's one question on uh, youtube sir uh, yeah this uh, most welcome yeah. will covid 19 uh, give birth to cosmos literature is there a possibility of covid 19 giving birth to cosmos literature yes i have told you that uh, there any any number of possibilities can come up because this is very uh, it is a perforated sheet you can say in a way it is a kind of a carnival of different ideas ideology because you see the literature that is written from uh, from the perspective of affluent because uh, if we are uh, what type of life we have undergone what type of things we are going to uh, undergone in doing this space so cosmos uh, uh, altruism um, different other uh, trauma um, romanticizing uh, then uh, leading to human uh, behavior leading to humanism everything can come in uh, this shape and different type of writings are being done it is very much subject to we ca um, uh, to uh, what little understanding i have i can say that we are not in a position to tell that what type of literature can be written because uh, if you are writing if you are writing something you are not going to copy others and your own experience are going to culminate into your writing or script your text 
so uh, different people coming from different background different people looking at the reality from different perspective they will translate the reality in their own way and under the forces that are uh, making them to write thank you sir thank you for your response yeah. there's one more question from ms shrilata yeah uh, shrilata kindly unmute yourself most welcome shrilata ji please ask your question kindly unmute and ask your question hello sir yes shrilata ji uh, sir at the outset i will really appreciate all your attempts in giving us uh, uh, new vistas which are open for literature in future Uh, a wonderful presentation from your side thank you, thank you very sir. much for all that and uh, the next next question is it is not connected with this topic actually but as i have understood that you visit various colleges as a part of nac and nba and you have direct contact with uh, ugc or uh, act people my request is you please convince them and make english literature as a part of engineering curriculum sir because that, that will make the students uh, more imaginative and more insightful than simply being practical uh, because that will give a new turn to english literature uh, in future sir this is my humble request and see that it is done uh, i really so much, must you, talk you kindly, uh, because uh, you kindly write uh, uh, such memorandum to Uh, our policy makers maybe they will be in a better position because i am also a teacher just like you at the uh, yes, and, uh, and we are 100 uh, years old university and uh, 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 okay i will not speak on that uh, uh, sometimes you see uh, the things are with us but how do we work with the things how uh, do we work with them getting yes. optimum use of the available resources uh, that is required that is required uh, because uh, as far as language lab is concerned uh, i have never been to language lab uh, i i know life. sir because language lab and everything though it is doing some work but uh, as we are now discussing the current scenario and how literature is more effective in uh, bringing in people into all these things uh, i believe engineering students also will have lot of things to uh, present when they have some insight into literature that's why yes um, literature you know uh, you must be aware very much aware because uh, i've also taught uh, the engineering students uh, so language through literature is very interesting um, practice you you teach your students uh, through literature i uh, suppose uh, when i compare my teaching to the engineering student as a teacher of professional communication and when i delivered a lecture for my uh, research scholars in the ramphil class a phd course work so it is easier to teach a phd course work student and uh, our ramphil scholar and it is more difficult to teach a graduate student the grammar <laughs> course because uh, it is a heterogeneous group many of them they say that uh, we understand these things the basic uh, functions of literature and language so uh, teaching that through literature makes interesting and then they get you see uh, this very famous essay by um uh, jonathan swift on style we get honey in the rock we uh, get honey in the rock yes sir uh, when we uh, when we study language out of literature we can get honey in the rock yes sir Uh, thank so, you very much sir the thank you it's not found at the end of the road but along the road we get the pleasure we are reading the text uh, thank you so much ma'am your 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 query your your comment is very valid and uh, yes, uh, but uh, i think it is not a uh, uh, appropriate platform to discuss that thing because uh, yes, that is sir. Yes, sir. Uh, out of this uh, topic and i True, think uh, ma'am of nagar uh, will not uh, Uh, and 100 percent, 100 percent true, sir. But now that I have come in contact with a person like you, I thought immediately I should ask this question. Otherwise, I won't get another opportunity. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, sir. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your presentation, and thank you so much for sharing your experiences. you have really given a personal touch to it uh, your poem which uh, stressed on the state of your mind 
must have resonated with many here and that is the beauty of literature how it enables us to connect with one another uh, even your meaningful discussions with your research scholars uh, you brought in the aspect of uh, market driven force and how editors and journals have created writers your remarks on your own skit were very interesting and uh, the possibilities of uh, post covid literature there could be folklore literature there could be pastiche there could be a resurgence of romantic literature so there are many possibilities for us to explore and we really appreciate uh, your deliberations and insights thank you sir once again for thank your thank you so much ma'am for giving me the chance to um, uh, you uh, the audience there thank you so much and uh, looking forward to um, uh, to associate you in the future thank you thank you sir thank you sir. Uh, moving ahead after uh, very enriching keynote and plenary sessions we have uh, finally reached the valedictory function and i request uh, ms reena patel to introduce our resource person for the valedictory, uh, valedictory session dr sachin labde over to you ms reena thank you dr rupa deshmukhya it is indeed my privilege to introduce our speaker at the valedictory function dr sachin labde dr labde has a rich experience of 20 years in teaching english literacy and linguistic studies he is presently working as an assistant professor at the department of english university of mumbai he has completed courses at the british and american studies center technical university of dresden germany in the spring of 2004 under the international student exchange program funded by daad dr labde is recognized as a research guide by the university of mumbai and his present research interest include queer studies south asian english studies english language pedagogy and contact languages he has presented research papers at several national and international conferences and has published a new a few research papers in reputed journals He recently translated a story book in Marathi, and has co-authored a chapter on English in India in Modeling World Englishes: A Joint Approach Towards Post-Colonial and Non-Post-Colonial Varieties. He has also contributed to a module on Collaboration for Transdisciplinary Research Development in E-Refresher course on Skills for New Educational Architecture. swayam ugc 2019-20 launched by the national resource center at sant gargay baba amravati university amravati besides he coordinates the university of mumbai's indo canadian studies center as well as the shastri indo canadian institutes university center i'm sure dr labde's address will help us to further the reflection on the theme of this webinar and also promote understanding of research in the field I welcome you, sir, to share your expert views on the topic. Over to you, Dr. Lamdu. Thank you. Dr. Sachin, kindly unmute yourself. Um, extremely sorry. Yeah. So, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you very much for a very generous introduction, and I feel very pleased and honored to be associated with this uh, webinar on a very relevant topic. Um, secondly, um, it. it it is an honor to be associated with uh, you know an institute uh, like bhavans which has been a pioneer institute in bringing about changes to our perspectives changes to <coughs> our lives and so i feel very proud to be associated um so to begin with i would like to thank the um, management and the principal of the college uh, dr rathod Uh, the co-convener of this webinar, Dr. Rupa Deshmukhia, um, her colleague and IQSC coordinator, um, Dr. Manjusha Patwardhan, um, and the entire uh, team which has been working 
rigorously to uh, make this webinar possible. I understand that, you know, since morning we have had uh, like amazing sessions on and deliberations on uh, post COVID-19 uh, literary scenario. So how exactly things are going to be. And, uh, you know, I'm actually struggling with two very important things. One is I'm struggling with the evil of, you know, being irrelevant. I am struggling with the evil of being, you know, outdated or being very uh, subjective. So I'll try and restrict my uh, interaction. I will try and avoid being repetitive, redundant, because uh, the speakers, uh, Dr. Kumi Vivaina, who actually set the tone of this webinar. Um, and afterwards we had, you know, very insightful sessions by um, doc Dr. Srivastav and Professor R.P. Singh. So we have had a lot of uh, in deliberations on what literature means uh, used to mean to us what literature now means to us and what literature literature could mean to us in future so um we are at this point you know we are actually forced to come back to present our future has come to halt our future has all of a sudden been undone we had so many plans we had you know like probably imagined our future in a different way so we've got a break. We've got a break to pause. We've got a break to ponder over. We've got a break to, you know, project or probably reproject on what we actually, uh, you know, have been constantly doing. Um, as I, you know, mentioned earlier, and also um, I'd like to repeat that my focus is going to be mainly on research in literary studies. Is there going to be any change, uh, you know, in our approach to uh, literary studies or research in literary studies? And I'm so, you know, glad to say this that uh, the previous speakers, in fact, the keynote addresser, you know, in her very lucid language, already mentioned this aspect that we cannot be, you know, in isolation. We cannot be in vacuum. We cannot be, you know, very subjective in the sense, very individualistic. We'll have to do this border crossing. We have to kind of, you know, take ourselves to different realms. We have to explore different uh, avenues and see how our literary research uh, becomes more and more relevant uh, in the times to come. So, um, I'll try to uh, remain you know, restricted to this area. But before that, I just quickly would like to ask the co-convener of this webinar that how much time do I have? Then accordingly, I can you know, shuffle uh, between my slides and reduce my presentation. Dr. Rupa? You have half an hour. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, there is some weird thing on my screen. I think there are some annotations on your screen, sir. Yeah, so um, I simply do not know how this has happened, but maybe it's just going to, uh, I'll quickly try and undo this. Hello. Yeah. Uh, probably I'm. I may not be able to remove uh, those scratches. Which. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Uh, someone has used the digital pen. Actually, it can scribble yeah. on your skin. Uh, just tell exactly. them to erase it. Just tell yeah. them to erase it. Whoever has done that digital pen uh, that vis is visible on the screen. Someone has uh, messed with that. Unfortunately, I don't have a control over that because it's not done from my side. Um, Edmund can say that. Edmund. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think even if we we can actually leave with the you know with that scratch, people are in fact there are going to be more scratches on my screen. That's absolutely fine. We have you know uh, those scars 
of uh, COVID-19 on our hearts and on our memories. So these scratches don't really mean anything before that. Okay, so we have certain questions which will you know haunt us um, hereafter. Not that there were no questions haunting us earlier, but we'll have fresh questions haunting us now. So some of the questions would be like, you know, when it's over, will things go back to how they were before? And I'm sure like question is something that we all have. Um, and another very relevant question is that, you know, what about us? Us as individuals, us as teachers, us as researchers, um, you know, will we remain the same? or will we go back to how the life was earlier? And definitely this one question, which uh, many research students will have, many research guides will have, uh, many of us will have uh, you know, part of our academic activities that will our research, will our academic activities remain the same? So these are some of the questions that we we'll try to address. I'm, not saying that we have answers to these questions, but let us begin asking these questions and see where it actually leads us. Okay, and uh, you know, if, if we look at uh, this present scenario, is this something unprecedented? Is this something that probably we could never imagine? Is this something uh, that you know, in the past, uh, there were no events that actually gave us you know uh, hints and ideas about these things. But I, I think you know if, uh, that's not the case. Recently, British Council published a report. Um, uh, its title is "80 Events That Changed the World in the 20th Century," um, and I'm not definitely going to talk about all the you know those events. But remember, this is very important that we have faced. You know, situations that really changed our perspective, whether it is about ourselves, whether it is about our religions, whether it is about our society, whether it is about our philosophy, the way we look at the world. These things have really forced us to change our perspective. And uh, uh, COVID-19 is probably, you know, uh, this new chapter added to uh, the series. So what we have is, you know, world war first whether it is First World War or Second World War, which actually changed our perspective. Then we have liberation. We have women liberation movements, which have changed not only the perspectives, it, it changed the way the world was organized, the way you know, our geography, our you know, landscape, our uh, you know, gender landscape was organized. Things have changed and things are still changing. Invention of computer, though it was seen you know, initially as a kind of uh, you know, maybe just a technical, uh, you know, addition and people perhaps did not imagine that how computers would change our perspectives, our ways, our interactions, our social, you know, connectivity. And so we have, you know, in invention uh, of computer. HIV AIDS really changed, you know, the way we kind of uh, looked at ourselves, individual society, things did not remain the same. And this happened especially after 1980s. WWW, that is World Wide Web. Um, and now we can see that, you know, as a result of this expanding territory of World Wide Web, we are in the absence of, you know, physical and social connectivity, uh, physical social connectivity, we are still able to talk to each other. We are still able to, you know, like interact with each other. And thanks to, you know, WWW that has changed this perspective. Um, and definitely we have 9-11, obviously um, in selecting these events, um, I may sound very biased or I may sound very west centric, but these were just, you know, a few images. And I don't really mean to say, that uh, these were the only events. We have load, a lot of events in India, pre-independence and post-independence that have changed our perspectives, that have changed the way we have thought of ourselves, our disciplines and everything. And definitely we have COVID-19 that has really, you know, like made us pause, ponder and reproject on what we have been doing so far. 
So if you have to summarize all of these events, either these are invasions. Now I'm using the word invasion in a very broad sense. Either it, these are invasions or these are inventions or these are discoveries or these are outbreaks like uh, you know, pandemic that we are facing right now or we had Spanish fever, which of course had nothing to do with Spain, uh, but we had Spanish fever in 1918 and 1919, which actually swept, you know, um, swept um, a big lot of you know, population from the world's map. And uh, then we have HIV, which are these outbreaks which have you know, made us to rethink and relocate ourselves, to reconsider. Um, so we have these outbreaks, we have eruptions, and we have developments. So all these things can be you know, like seen as um, you know, those actions which have kind of forced us to change our perspective. And definitely we cannot remain the same uh, with you know, uh, this change. Now the question is that as far as literary studies are concerned, as far as literary research is concerned, it's not that you know, literature has, uh, literary studies haven't undergone you know, any changes. Uh, we, we know right from you know, like, uh, the uh, post-World uh, War that we had um, postmodernism, which affected our perception uh, of literature, art, and life uh, in general. Then we had structuralism, which you know, changed our perspective towards philosophy, towards truth, towards science towards language, towards literature, though it did not last long, what it did is that, you know, it actually expanded itself or it kind of, you know, gave birth to something much more engaging, much more critical, much more filled with nuances that is post-structuralism. And uh, these perspectives have, you know, changed our ways of looking at literature, looking at our of our engagement with literature. We had post-colonialism, we still have post-colonialism, and we are trying to revive and making it more and more relevant in the times to come. Definitely Marxism you know, figures in, this, uh, in, in, in those theories, then you have new historicism, you have feminism, and uh, you know, generally uh, this one particular theory which goes uh, I won't say it is a product of feminism, but you know it actually generally is coupled with feminism. That is queer theory, and that has changed our perspective. Uh, that has changed the world. Uh, today we see ourselves. Today we see others in a different way uh, than we used to see earlier. Eco criticism, post humanism. Obviously, many of us will definitely have objection to the word post humanism. Like uh, we are now talking about reviving humanism and we are not talking about liberal humanism as such, which was maybe, you know, uh, kind of promoted by the Western philosophy, Western ideology, but we are looking at humanity in a very different light as well. So uh, it's not about, you know, post humanities, but it is post humanism that has changed our way that we could engage with literary studies and now we have digital humanities on which I definitely do not have any mastery or any command, but I acknowledge that digital humanities are going to be very relevant in the times to come. And these are the theories which have changed our perspectives. Now the question is that, are we going to stick to these theories or is COVID-19 situation going to change or expand or probably you know, like renegotiate our engagement with these theories? and approaching literature to, to these theories. Now, these are some of the questions that we have to take into consideration. Now, why are we talking about uh, you know, uh, these things? It's very important to admit that in the present situation, that what we have, and um, I, I would like to go back to what uh, Dr. Uh, Kumi Vivaina, Professor Kumi Vivaina, you know, talked about in her presentation that what we have is not facts. What we do have is not reality. What we have is narratives. We have narratives of the reality. We have narratives of the fact. And right now we are all experiencing that uh, you know, there is no one narrative, right? There's no one narrative. We have plethora of narratives and we are trying to understand 
we are trying to make sense of the world through this plethora of narratives and it's very important that among these narratives we have some narratives which come from literature and so we'll have to think about it this is a very famous uh, you know um, image or the you know like what do you call the parable that we have uh, from our indian you know mythology that is the uh, the parable of uh, an elephant and uh, seven blind men or blind men and what we know is that you know each one of them perceives the elephant in a very different way because their perception is based on their experience and that is what is happening to the world around us there is no one version of reality there is no one narrative of reality reality is probably you know it's it it cannot be captured it cannot be contained in one specific way and so what we have is that we have different narratives but until and unless we try and blend these narratives we try and you know kind of juxtapose these narratives we will not be able to see uh, you know a bigger picture we will, we will not be able to see uh, you know a wider picture and that is what uh, you know um, research is going to be all about i believe again you know i'm making a very huge statement when i'm saying that research is going to be about this about that Pro this is like purely individual expression individual impression of how you know uh, research is going to be now what we have uh, as i already mentioned um is you know this we have this plethora of narratives uh, right in front of us we have international narratives of what's happening you know for, uh, in the advent of or in the wake of covid 19 we have national and nationalist narratives uh, which are making circles on different you know groups we have regional narratives uh, we have social media narratives we are all experience in this you know we are in some way or the other associated with this or that made social uh, media and narratives through these media then we have media narratives we have medical narratives we have legal narratives we have scientific narratives we have human rights narratives again human rights looked at from um again western construct or the eurocentric uh, you know uh, construct of um human rights then we have literary narratives um my apologies for putting literary narratives towards the end i'm definitely not putting them in an order or in hierarchy i definitely i wanted to put literary narratives towards the end just to kind of you know uh, give this idea that literary narratives are influenced but not necessarily uh, you know will they reflect the same stories or same narratives they will definitely have a different way there is imagination involved in this and this is not the first time that literature is coming up with this kind of you know narrative uh dr kumi vivana has already talked about this in her presentation even uh, dr shivas has talked about you know uh, apocalyptic and the post apocalyptic world um and how literature has visioned a post apocalyptic world now in you know if we take into consideration all these aspects what we realize is that we are definitely not in an you know uh, unprecedented situation we are definitely not in you know a situation where we could probably we never imagine that this would happen you now we have to just go back 20 years we have to just go back 100 years and we have to understand that you know literature was telling us right from the beginning that you know in you know these are the situations that would happen and in future what are the future you know like uh, how future can be imagined in a very dystopic uh, sense not in a utopian world view but dystopic and dystopian world view that we have had uh, right from brave new world we have time machine that we have uh, wb yeats who has been my favorite uh, poet right from the beginning and who has been constantly uh, you know uh, referred to uh, in this uh, webinar that who has who you know imagined the world and who was talking about the history of civilization changes every uh, 200 uh, years and uh, and he was imagining how the future is going to be so it's not that you know uh, literature has not warned us literature has not kind of you know given us uh, you know a possible 
view of the world in future, the question is that what have we been doing with this? Do we need to now you know, think of only future or we need to kind of uh, take a look at what has been there? So I would like to emphasize on the, the re, that is the, the, the prefix that we are going to use, that the re of re in this research. Now, what, are, what is this re in this research? And I must say this, I am being repetitive. I am repeating what Dr. R. P. Singh, uh, Professor R. P. Singh mentioned in his presentation. Dr. Kumi Vivana talked about it, or even uh, you know, Dr. Shivastav talked about it, that we, our research is going to be about reflection. I'm not talking about reflexes. I'm talking about reflection. It's going to be about revisiting our you know, uh, past considerations revisiting literature, revisioning literature, revisioning literary studies, reconsidering certain uh, hypotheses or reconsidering certain you know, um, probably uh, assumptions that we have uh, taken for, you know, things that we have taken for granted. We'll have to renegotiate as, um, and uh, I'm very happy that I'm repeating what Dr. R. P. Uh, Professor R. P. Singh mentioned in his presentation, that definitely we have to have renegotiation. We have to renegotiate with a lot of things, with literature, with our understanding of literature, our engagement with literature. Revaluation is definitely the way and definitely we'll have to reject certain things. Reject probably kind of hypothesis that we had, reject the kind of thesis that we had, re and you know, probably look at things in a different perspective. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, you know, we have to sweep aside everything that was happening in the past, but I'm saying that there is a possibility that we'll have to undergo these processes. Again, going back to what uh, Dr. Kumi Vivana mentioned in her presentation beautifully, and I, uh, I, I know I will not come anywhere closer to the clarity with which she actually talked about the relevance of literature, I know, in education. And also, you know, for, uh, in, uh, in the previous session, Dr. R.P. Singh was addressing one of the questions on uh, making, you know, literature part of uh, engineering curriculum. Uh, so we have to think about this. This is something called border crossing. Now, what kind of border crossing are we talking about and why it becomes relevant at this stage, as the, at this point of you know, time? Uh, this is very important. Now, when we are talking about border crossing, um, it automatically you know, clicks the idea such as there has to be something you know, crossing the border of discipline, right? So whether we are talking about humanities, we are talking about social sciences, we are talking about technology, we are talking about engineering, um, which Dr. Kumi Vivana mentioned in her presentation, which even some of the concerns which were shown, the questions which were asked that, you know, uh, we need to bring literature into uh, uh, engineering or technology, and we need to make, you know, our students more responsive to, uh, you know, and more sensible, sensitive, uh, towards the world, you know, world around us, uh, or what we call uh, the 21st century skills, and literature plays a very important role in these 21st, 21st century skills, promoting such skills. So interdisciplinary, you know, is one way of looking at border crossing. The second way of border crossing is multidisciplinarity. Um, now, some of us might also, you know say or believe that we have always been interdisciplinary, right? We are talking about uh, literature and then we are, you know, like kind of um, taking the point, uh, taking the perspective of gender studies, we are interdisciplinary. Philosophy has constantly been guiding us, so we are interdisciplinary. Or say linguistics has had its influence on literary studies, so we are interdisciplinary. But I think, you know, we need to go beyond uh, the singular engagement in the sense like, you know, when we conduct research, uh, you conduct it in a, in a very singular manner. It's not a collaboration. It's not something that we come together. Right? So we probably will have to think about this. We'll have to probably go beyond. We'll have to, you know, uh, kind of cross the threshold of this discipline to interact with the, you know, uh, faculties from different disciplines. 
uh, that is what we call interdisciplinary if it is two disciplines involved and multidisciplinary if it is more disciplines involved and i think you know covid 19 situation probably like uh, unlike other you know the events in the past is literally forcing us to you know cross these borders cross these thresholds and see that can we you know like interact can we collaborate with our colleagues from different disciplines uh, can we then have a better understanding can we have a broader perspective on not only literature but how you know literature could be relevant uh, you know in the present situation and sorry i'm i'm sorry the, the last very important aspect of this border crossing is transdisciplinary um one of the questions that you might have not all of you but some of you might have this question is that aren't these three expressions or three uh, you know for concepts um one and the same uh, like you are talking about inter then you are talking about multi or multi then you are talking about trans so all these mean that you know crossing your discipline but still you know there are these nuances there are those you know differences uh and um i'll mainly you know try to show this difference through uh, this graphic presentation not that you know it makes a lot of sense but still i am making this attempt that what you see in all these is that disciplinary is a single a discipline approach the singularity which we have to reject uh, not that you know we don't have to be disciplinary but we need to extend we need to go beyond discipline we need to be multidisciplinary in the sense uh, taking perspectives from different disciplines is important but still as you see the you know for graphic presentation it only kind of takes different perspectives it does not really embed it does not really blend them so it's like okay i have a better understanding but what do you do with that better understanding is not something that we uh, probably can uh, you know gain in multidisciplinary approach then we have interdisciplinary uh, as we said you know where there are disciplines involved and you know one discipline informs and influences the other discipline uh, and th that is what uh, would be the difference between multi and multi and uh, interdisciplinary uh, obviously i am referring to very standard definitions of uh, inter and in, uh, multidisciplinary research but um, there could be you know differences of opinions on this the last and according to me very very relevant uh, and also relevant because the government of india uh, you know in the last two years uh, has been constantly promoting the idea of uh, transdisciplinary research and so uh, yeah if please you know, stop me at any point of time if um, i'm overthinking dr rupa yes sir uh, five more minutes great great thank you thank you yeah so the transdisciplinary research is what we can see is that there is something that includes these disciplines something which is beyond these disciplines and that is what is going to be a defining feature of transdisciplinary research so there is this need for integration of uh, education with research in various disciplines and there are two very important key concepts uh, which i would like to highlight and which dr kumi vivaina had already mentioned in her presentation is that collaboration we have to collaborate we have to go you know beyond discipline to collaborate with people it's not that you know i take psycho linguistic or psychoanalytic perspective and uh, sort of offer a different reading or perspective on literature that is not collaboration that's like my engagement but when i say collaboration i have to have interaction with the disciplines and people in the researchers from different disciplines um then we have transdisciplinary as we are already mentioned communication is another aspect so um this is what you know transdisciplinary approach is going to look like where uh, we have different disciplines involved and trying to solve a particular problem so creating a unity of intellectual frameworks beyond the disciplinary perspectives is what and how transdisciplinary could be defined 
it integrates the natural and social sciences in a humanitarian context and transcends them uh, beyond or transcends their traditional boundaries. So how different it is from multidisciplinary approach? Very important thing is that number one, is that real life situation or problem which shows a global concern or maybe regional concern, national concern, is what is at the center of your research objective. It's not just reading, it's not just giving perspectives, but you are faced with a real life situation, real life problem. And this problem can be solved only when you have researchers coming from different you know, borders, whether these are national borders, these are disciplinary borders, it is these borders which are going to you know, make a contribution to solving the problem of uh, you know, a social nature. And that is what I think is new uh, as far as our approach to literary research or our approach to research is going to be. So many research problems are so complex that these days that they require expertise from more than one academic field. They require a multi-pronged effort. They can be anything from cancer treatment to water quality to prevention of art, of the arts. It's hard to even name a challenge, truthfully. Uh, as we say, you know, it's hard to name a challenge and today we have a challenge which we probably did not think of in the past. Uh, that doesn't touch uh, on multiple realms of expertise and disciplines. This is the observation made by you know, Valerie Johnson, who is managing director uh, uh, of uh, Macubed uh, University of Michigan. And it's very important that we try and see uh, literary studies uh, in, in the light of this. Of course, we are going to have a lot of challenges uh, to this kind of transdisciplinary approach. We'll have structural challenges, we'll have cultural challenges, we'll have linguistic challenges. But through collaboration and cooperation, we will be able to address uh, these challenges. Okay, uh, this is something that I wanted to talk about, but as we have less time and we won't be really uh, able to focus on this, is digital humanities in the light of uh, you know, COVID situation. And all of us are actually experiencing, you know, we are now part of uh, something called digital humanities the way we are connected to each other, the way we are pondering, the way we are contemplating on the present situation. Um, so this is one thing that we'll have to now take very seriously in the times to come. Okay, so that's my presentation. Um, and um, I would like to begin with this wake up call. If at all, you're not around. So please come back. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your um, you know patient listening. I will be more than happy to uh, address the questions, not that I have uh, answers to all the questions, but please feel free to shoot your questions. Uh, Dr. Rupa Deshmukhya, thank you very much. Uh, I hand the session over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. Uh, first of all, apologies for the annotations uh, before the beginning of your presentation. No problem. No problem. And uh, we are really fortunate uh, that you gave a good comprehensive coverage and you looked at it uh, from various lens of various events, uh, World War I to the invention of technology and how we are looking at humanities today in a novel way. So is post-COVID going to renegotiate our response to these theories? This is something that we are going to mull over and we have numerous narratives uh, we need to reflect over them. Uh, so we will uh, definitely renegotiate and we'll look at the interdisciplinary research. So your emphasis on collaboration, your emphasis on transdisciplinary research and how we need to move towards this uh, transdisciplinary approach was brilliant. Uh, and it was a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for your insights. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, sir. Uh, if anybody has a question, uh, we could take uh, one or two questions. You may raise your hand. I think people are reflecting and they'll take back all the good memories that they had at this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sachin.
my pleasure. Thank you. So we've come to the end of uh, our session, end of our webinar, and I'm grateful to one and all present here. Uh, I now invite uh, Dr. Sandeep Mai, the organizing secretary of this webinar, to propose vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rupa Deshmukhe, madam. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Yes. Good afternoon, one and all. It is my privilege to propose vote of thanks on behalf of Bhavan Sazari Malsamani College of Arts and Science and Jairam Das Patel College of Commerce and Management Studies, I, Dr. Sandeep Main, extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who have made this webinar possible. At the outset, my earnest thankfulness to the esteemed chief guest, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ravindra Kulkarni for gracing the inaugural function. I thank the chairperson of Board of Scholars in English, University of Mumbai, Dr. Sudhir Nikam for collaborating with our college for such a fruitful academic venture. I also thank all the members of Board of Studies in English, University of Mumbai. I am extremely grateful to our keynote speaker, Dr. Kumi Vevena, for our enlightening address. Her effective presentation on the relevance of the literature in the post-COVID world was very thought-provoking. Thank you very much, madam. I thank our resource person at the plenary session, namely Dr. Sharas Srivastava and Dr. R.P. Singh for their scholarly presentation and deliberation on the literary issue. I express my gratitude to the management of our college for granting us the permission to conduct this webinar. I would take this opportunity to sin sincerely thank our uh, principal, Professor Dr. S.U. Rathod, sir, for his unwavering support and motivation to organize such an educational activity. My thanks are due to the IQC coordinator, Dr. Manjusha Patwardhan, for tireless efforts and commitment towards the betterment of our college. I also thank the convener of this webinar, Ms. Halloween, for organizing a webinar on such a significant topic. I thank the co-convener of this webinar, Dr. Rupa Deshmukhya, for her effort and coordination. I thank all the IQC committee members for their unconditional support. I would also like to thank active member of our alumni, Srimati Sarika Athalde and Rotarian Sri Rupen Doshi for their guidance and support. My thanks are due to the member of our technical team, Ms. Jordana Miranda and our librarian, Ms. Bindu, who gave diligently work towards organizing this webinar. Finally, I wish to place on record my deep appreciation towards all the participants whose overwhelming response has truly moved us. Look forward to your presence in the upcoming webinar as well. Thank you all. Stay home, stay safe. Now, at last, I would like to make one announcement. Uh, the feedback link will be uh, email you during 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, in the register email address, as well as it is posted on the Telegram group. So everybody, please bear with us. During 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., you have to submit the, the form for e-certificate. Over to Rupa, ma'am. Thank you, Sandeep, sir. Thanks are also due to you for uh, extending your support in organizing this webinar. Thank you all. Have a good day ahead. Thank you.